Uh, good morning and welcome to the 29th meeting of the Health and Sport Committee in 2017. Uh, could I ask everyone in the room to ensure their mobile phones are switched to silent? You can use them for uh, social media, but please don't take photographs or record proceedings. The first uh, item on our agenda is the selection of a new EU, EU reporter to work alongside uh, Brian Whittle, who's our other uh, EU rep uh, reporter on the committee. Um, can I invite any comments from members? Brian Whittle will be an EU reporter. He's already an EU reporter. Oh, sorry, I, I moved that Emma <laughs> Harper become an EU reporter. Thank My you. Apologies <laughs> <to me. laughs> I'm not an EU reporter, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Any other comments? <laughs> OK, it's agreed that uh, Emma Harper will be the new committee EU reporter. Congratulations, Emma. Thank you very much. Um, agenda item two is scrutiny of NHS boards. And we have uh, uh, guests from the Ayrshire and Arn, uh, board this morning. Can I welcome to the committee John Burns, Chief Executive, uh, Dr Martin Chain, Chairman, Derek Lindsay, Director of Finance, and uh, Tim Eltringham, uh, Director of South Ayrshire Health and Social Care Partnership. Could I invite uh, one or all of you to make an opening statement? very much, uh, Chair, if I may. Um, so you've done the introductions for me kindly. Thank you very much. Um, we have submitted a briefing paper to you, uh, and I hope that has been helpful to the, the committee uh, members uh, today. NHS Ayrshandan, like many health systems, faces many challenges as the needs of our population change. And it is essential that we continue to adapt and innovate to meet those challenges. As a board, we realise that we have a duty to use the resources available to us to support prevention and to deliver care and treatment to our population. In doing so, we recognise that we wish to do this in a way that reflects the ambition of the triple aim of best value, better health and better care. Our teams working across health and social care are committed to delivering the best services possible to our population and we have a strong approach to continuous improvement. As chairman of the board, I can assure you that we scrutinise the performance of our services through our governance arrangements, and we have set out the, the, the way we do that in the briefing paper. At the recent annual review, the cabinet secretary did ask the non-executive directors if they felt that they received the information needed, and if they could seek, if they did seek additional information, did they get it to uh, fulfil their scrutiny and assurance role? In response, the non-executive direct directors were clear that they felt well supported and would ask and receive additional information if required. And I think this reflects what John and I have tried to do in developing an open uh, culture in NHS Erschendarn, which values all staff and the important contribution they make. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Um, could we have Ivan to begin? Thanks, convener, and thanks um, for coming along to talk to us uh, this morning. Um, what I'm interested in is understanding a bit more um, about... Uh, we've obviously got a number of indicators here and where you are against target, and, and that's fine. I'm more interested in what sits behind that, what process improvement processes you've got in place, your understanding for any one of those indicators, what causes the number to be where it is, what action plans you've got sat behind that, um, that drive that, where your trends are over time, are you understanding the mechanism, implementing the actions and seeing improvements in, in numbers? Do you, do you have that mechanism clear in your own in your own heads? Um, and then a bit about um, what you're doing to learn from other boards that are maybe got a better performance and you know, understand there's obviously differentials in terms of your population profile, etc. But clearly there will be people out there that are, are making progress in other areas. Are you learning from that and, and what's the mechanism for doing that? Um, and then if, um, yeah, so we'll start with that and see how we go on. Okay. Uh, yeah, thanks. I'll, I'll uh, kick off. Um, I think fundamental to the work that we do in Ayrshire is, is uh, around improvement. Uh, we have a strong ethos around learning. Um, the indicators that we uh, report on um, are uh, uh, indicators of that performance and therefore cause us to scrutinise and challenge where that performance isn't uh, uh, achieving uh, the, the desired uh, goal. I think importantly, uh, understanding what we can do to improve that, so action plans behind that. Some of that is, is, uh, uh, is, is quite difficult in terms of 
uh, uh, some of the workforce challenges that we face that would uh, help with some of that improvement in action. But we're very clear as a board that we need to be able to have a continuous improvement philosophy that's focused on delivering the best we can. I think in terms of trends, we use data a lot, and I think that's really important. Um, and we look at the uh, data over time. Uh, we understand um, what our data is telling us. I think that's fundamentally important. Um, and we know uh, across a whole range of indicators um, that, that we report on um, uh, how, uh, as an organisation, we uh, were performing. If you look at some of that, and then we can see that in terms of HSMR data, where we look at trends over time, our uh, infection control data over time, uh, to make sure that we see that continuous improvement uh, and monitor that um, against all of the data points. I think in terms of learning from other boards, uh, again, we, we do engage uh, regionally, and I think there's a stronger basis now with our focus around regional delivery planning and working in that regional context. But we also work across NHS Scotland um, and through uh, seeking to work in collaboratives. There's been some very good examples of collaborative working, I think, in NHS Scotland, which is a, a strong way to learn and share best practice. Uh, then we do seek to, to understand who's doing it uh, in a way that's delivering the improvement that we are maybe not. Um, I think we can do more of that as Ayrshire and Arne and keep looking. Um, and I would suggest looking beyond uh, the traditional boundaries of even uh, Scotland and, and, and beyond to see who is actually delivering, uh, in some cases, transformative change to help us try and improve targets. Okay. Um, would you like to give me some specific examples then? I mean, just pick one or two indicators and drill down and tell me, right, to fix this, we've done this, this and this, and this is what it's done. Um, or we've learned such and such from mm -hmm. somebody else, or we've got a challenge here and these are the 10 things, or whatever number of things it happens yep. to be that we're, 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 we're implementing that kind of ground level, if you like, mm -hmm. to try and drive some improvement there. So I think um, I would pick uh, infection control. Right. Um, we have been uh, focused very much around the C. difficile target for a number of years in Ayrshire. Um, we uh, introduced a, a summit uh, about 18 months ago where we brought clinical leads because we weren't making the improvements that we wanted to see. There was improvement there, but not at the pace we wanted. Um, and that renewed focus has seen us deliver in the last financial year, uh, deliver on the, the national target for uh, C. difficile. So um, I think that's a very good example of looking at trends, taking action. I think the other areas that I would uh, pick out, unscheduled care, um, where, and this is where we look to learn from uh, other systems uh, and see where we can bring improvements uh, and work with national colleagues. So again, we have uh, delivered change uh, in our unscheduled care uh, programme uh, through uh, increasing um, our uh, activity at the front door terms of senior decision making, uh, the introduction of combined assessment units to bring a different uh, um, support into our front door services uh, and trying to support people to return home earlier. And we've seen significant improvement uh, on the back of combined assessment units in terms of unscheduled care. And so there'd be two examples that I would uh, I would highlight. So in C. difficile, what, what did you actually do? What changed in the, the operation that made that different? Well, I think the, the, what changed was that um, uh, having had discussion over many years with clinical colleagues, we, we created this, uh, this focus, this summit for clinical colleagues to come and have, uh, I suppose, a, a discussion, uh, uh, to be immersed in that discussion with a clear focus around what further improvement we could do, working with Health Protection Scotland um, and taking learning and suggestion and then being very clear about the delivery plan and our implementation of that and then monitoring the, the delivery of that uh, and having a very active engagement in that delivery through our infection so control team. what did people working in the wars actually do? Diff I mean, getting everybody in a room and having a summit doesn't fix anything. What did people actually working in the wars do differently that caused that number to get better? I think that... I think the well, we've, well, it, it, some, some of these are difficult to pinpoint exact actions, but there was no doubt that there was a stronger leadership in terms of the work we were doing. Um, our infection control team worked more, even more closely 
uh, with our ward teams. Um, we were uh, ensuring, and I think this is important, ensuring that the implementation and delivery plan was rigorously scrutinised and monitored through the Infection Control Committee uh, and making sure that our systems and processes were as tight as they could be and that everyone understood what they were required to do. So there was no one specific thing. I think there was a range of issues that we brought into uh, that plan that allowed us to deliver uh, that improvement. OK. Um, flip it on its head. If I'm somebody working in a ward right, um, and I've got a good idea about how I can make things better, you're doing this, but if you did that, it would improve whatever. Um, and there will be a wealth of knowledge amongst uh, people that are working on the front line there. What is the process whereby that gets translated into some action that you make that makes things better? So on a number of levels. Firstly, we encourage everyone uh, to... Uh, uh, be able to openly discuss things that they think can improve. And if they think they can do it in their local team, uh, to work within that team and do it. Um, secondly, if they think it's a bigger issue, then uh, to raise it with uh, the, the appropriate line manager um, and, uh, you know, to, to, and for that line manager to then work with that team to, to develop that improvement um, and, and to, to help, to enable, to, to introduce and progress that. I think the, the, one of the things we've introduced recently is a, is a staff suggestion scheme. Mm -hmm. uh, not everything can be done in the local context, and indeed some colleagues will have ideas that go beyond their area of responsibility. So we encourage our staff across Ayrshire to, to share their ideas, um, to hear their improvement, because uh, it is through our staff that we will find those areas uh, where further improvement can take place. Okay. Okay, final question. Um, we've got Harry Burns in later to talk about his, um, his um, review of indicators. Do you, do you have any observations on that? Any comments on that? Are we measuring the right things? Are we measuring the wrong things? Should we be doing it differently? I, I think the, the um, indicators and targets have served us well. I think they should always be kept under review, and I, I think Sir Harry's report is a welcome report in terms of some of the challenge he puts into thinking beyond where we are. Uh, I think as we work increasingly in a, an integrated health and social care uh, space and arrangements, then thinking about outcome and how we measure outcome in that integrated way is, is going to be uh, an important aspect for the future. Um, but I think there are uh, targets and indicators that, that continue to um, uh, set a, a, a strong purpose. I think the A&E target, and I think if I remember Sir Harry's report, he says uh, it's still a, a valuable uh, target, not as an A&E indicator, but as a whole system indicator. And I, I, I would agree with that. So I think it's a helpful challenge. I think we should be looking to progress uh, and constantly keep indicators and targets under review and, and move as, as, we, as, as, as we can to focus on outcomes. OK, thank you. Uh, just in relation to the C. diff stuff, um, they're still not meeting the target? Uh, we met the target in the last financial year. Um, on the performance standards that we've got here, uh, <coughs> doesn't appear to be, since current target 60, current value 64. Yes, in the current year, um, against the current measures, then uh, we have seen a, a slight movement, uh, but we will uh, we continue to keep that under review, uh, and we're still confident that we can uh, maintain our performance here. So have you met it? We met it in terms of, at the last financial year we met it, where it's where the, the end of year measurement in terms of heat, our in-year performance uh, and I think, uh, convener, that's the, the data you're referring to. Uh, we are uh, slightly above uh, our, our target, our local target at this time. In relation to that, um, Mr McKee asked you about um, specific actions that had been done to improve that. Um, I have to say, you couldn't really tell us what those specific actions are. So if, if that's the case, then how can your board help others learn if you can't tell us what those specific actions were? Well, I don't have the specific uh, in detail uh, at my fingertips, I think, that, and I'd be happy to provide that uh, for the committee. Yeah. Um, yeah. <coughs> okay. Um, okay. Uh, anybody else want to come in on any of the performance standards issues at the moment? We may come back to that then. Um, Colin. It's going to be now, uh, good morning to the, the, the panel. There's a number of areas in the performance standards where um, there's red alerts on and that you're not meeting, for example, in 
uh, treatment time guarantees, um, 18 week referral time, uh, GP appointment booking, all of that. What, what's your kind of um, response to those issues where performance is, in, in some areas, is considerably, uh, you know, looks pretty pretty poor in terms of like 12 week treatment time guarantee 20% below what should be 18 week referral time is 15% below. What's your response to that and how are you going to address that? In terms of the 18 week uh, referral to treatment time, uh, we have detailed demand capacity uh, model so we understand uh, what we need to do. We have some challenges in the system around workforce. What does detailed demand capacity mean? Um, we have looked at uh, the referrals that we receive in each of our specialties. We've looked at the capacity we have uh, in our clinics and in our workforce, and we've tried to, to match to understand uh, whether we're able to meet those referrals, that activity coming through the system. So is that recruitment then? Uh, some of it um, is, is in, in recruitment, um, and that's why we, we've been working. Uh, we've had to bring in some, some locum staff. Um, some of it is uh, capacity where we are looking to uh, adjust uh, our capacity. Uh, so, for example, we're looking at uh, new, return, uh, new appointments versus return appointments and working with our clinical teams to see if there is a way to uh, rebalance some of that activity. Uh, we know that we, there, there is evidence that not all uh, return appointments uh, are necessarily uh, need to be made uh, with someone attending hospital. So we're looking to redesign uh, to improve our capacity where we can. So this year uh, we're looking to reduce um, in our uh, review attendances by about 7,500 reviews and convert that into um, uh, approximately just uh, 3,000 new attendances. And that tends to be the broad ratio that we, we would see in Ayrshire. So we're trying to enhance our capacity for uh, outpatients. We have um, funds, uh, access funds from Scottish Government that we are using uh, to uh, impact and reduce the uh, outpatient waiting time. So we have made a uh, considerable change in the last year, but uh, I agree it's an area that requires further work and we continue to keep that under very close review. In terms of the treatment time guarantee, then the issue is primarily around orthopaedics. Um, there are one or two other areas in the, that we are addressing, but orthopaedics is our main area, and we are bringing that uh, down gradually um, over time as we try and put more, more elective capacity uh, into our orthopaedic service. It may be helpful then, so we don't dwell on this, that for each of those you could um, write to the committee, giving us an indication of um, what action is ongoing to improve that and what improvement you expect is because of that action. Is that okay? Yep, happy to do that. Colin. <coughs> Thanks, Convener. Can, can I follow that up with a, a specific question <laughs> uh, about one performance indicator in particular? What explanation can you give for the fact that the NHS Ayrshire Naran's performance against the 62-day target for cancer referrals has fallen from 92.8% between January and March 2017 to 88.5%? from April to June 2017. What was the reason for that fall and what action have you taken to, to improve on that target? Uh, the main issue we face is um, diagnostic capacity um, so that we, uh, we, we, we work with other boards, so we work with Glasgow as well as uh, our own uh, um, diagnostic teams. Um, and we know that within our own uh, position in Ayrshire, uh, we have radiology, challenges, particularly around CT scanning, uh, and that is predominantly a, a workforce issue in terms of radiologists uh, and radiology vacancies. But we keep that, again, under very close review because cancer is one of those areas uh, that we, we strive to ensure that we are managing referrals, uh, diagnostics, uh, and treatment as effectively as we can. And this is an area that we are very focused in trying to improve. You say you've got diagnostic capacity. Is that staffing problems? Uh, we have vacancies. We have right. consultant radiology vacancies. Um, and so uh, the, uh, um, it, it's reporting capacity that, that is, uh, is a challenge for us. But we work very closely with our, our radiology team uh, to ensure that we are uh, prioritising and focusing in on uh, cancer services and we'll be looking to do everything we can uh, to make sure that that figure improves. 
The one thing you haven't mentioned, though, is the review of chemotherapy services that has been carried out by, by the board. You started that review in 2014. You said you would carry out an options appraisal in 2015. What exactly have you been doing for the past two years? Because I've looked through the health board's papers for the last two years. I can't find it mentioned anywhere. I can't find it mentioned on the website, apart from the fact there'll be an options appraisal in 2015. Why is it being trickled out that you're currently considering the closure of uh, chemotherapy services at Air Hospital? Why is that not in the public domain? And what exactly have you been doing since you started that review? So we, as you, as you say, we did an option appraisal with uh, the involved staff, users and, and, and uh, uh, other interested groups. Um, the, uh, that was a detailed option appraisal. Uh, we concluded that and then uh, there was a, a consideration as to whether this would be significant service change. Um, we worked with the Scottish Health Council around that. Uh, in order to, 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 to come to a view on that, we were asked to do a transport impact study, which we did, uh, and that took a bit of time. Um, and then, having done all of that, uh, we did get to a point where it was agreed that this wasn't a significant service change. In the meantime, and I, I, I accept this has taken a long period of time. This, this is not, I want to clarify, this is not impacted on the service we deliver because we are delivering our chemotherapy services in Ayrshire um, and I would say highly effectively delivering our chemotherapy services in Ayrshire. Um, but what we uh, are now considering is that in the west of Scotland there has been some work around systemic anti-cancer treatment uh, work. Um, we are taking account of that. Uh, because I think it gives some other opportunities to look at uh, the model for Ayrshire. Um, and uh, we, we will be continuing to uh, have a discussion with uh, staff and patients in the, the months ahead. We will take a, a full paper uh, to public board meeting in January, setting out what we would now consider as uh, a model uh, of service. And then in the spring, uh, we would intend to consult uh, on those proposals uh, widely uh, uh, across Ayrshire. So, so why has none of this information been in the public domain? You mentioned a transport appraisal. That's the first time you about that. You talked about the options appraisal. We still don't know exactly what those options are, apart from what's been trickled out. Why, why is this not being carried out in the public domain so the public can actually have their say on it? Well, we have uh, worked with um, our staff and users of the service. What we haven't done is, is to formally consult on any change. Um, the reason that I, you know, we, so we, we, um, we realise that we need to review uh, our chemotherapy services and how we deliver them. Uh, we want to deliver the best services uh, to our residents in Ayrshire. Um, and we believe that um, we, uh, given the, the further work that's been done, uh, it would be wrong to go and consult on what we have done, that we should bring into that consideration uh, some wider learning uh, from that West of Scotland work, uh, review uh, our proposition um, and uh, consult on a revised uh, paper. So at the moment, the public perception is you're going to centralise chemotherapy services on a single site in Ayrshire. Are you saying that's currently under review, that that may not be the proposals that you bring to the board in January? What I'm saying is that, that we will bring proposals to the board in January that will uh, be built on the, the best evidence available for delivering chemotherapy services in a way that provides that uh, service to our residents in a safe way. Uh, and we'll take account of all of the evidence. It would be premature for me at this stage to say uh, what that final proposition would look like. Uh, you mentioned a, a minute ago that the performance was good, and yet it's fallen from 92 down to 83. Um, does that reflect a good performance? So I would draw a distinction between the uh, cancer, the, the diagnostic and treatment target, so that 60 duty target, no, I'm not saying that's a good performance. I'm saying that uh, in say, the 62 day performance, uh, which is diagnostic and treatment, uh, we need to uh, do much better. Uh, we have had a very good, uh, you know, looking at the trend data in Ayrshire, we have had very good performance in cancer. 
Uh, we continue to have very good performance in the 31-day target, which is once there is diagnosis, uh, delivering treatment, and then chemotherapy, um, which is then the next stages in, in treatment. Um, I believe we deliver that service very effectively, um, but we need to keep all services under review to make sure we deliver them safely and to the best evidence. So you said you want to do better. What are you going to do and how long is it going to take, given what Colin Smith has just referred to, that other changes seem to be taking a very long time? So the trend that we have, uh, our, our cancer performance over time has uh, been uh, uh, performed well, and, and, and we will... Uh, we will do everything we can to quickly get back to that standard. Uh, we recognise the importance can I ask of the again standard. what, you know, I, I mean, I'm hearing repeatedly, Ivan McKee as well, mm. a lot of words. What we need to know is practically what are you going to do? Um, if any of the other <coughs> panellists would like to comment on any of this, feel free. But what practical steps are you going to take? We need to address the capacity issue, the, uh, the reporting issue. So what does that mean? Well, that's, I don't have that answer in terms of uh, the, the specifics. We are, we, we've been uh, uh, very aware of this. This is a recent uh, issue in terms of this drop in performance. Uh, and we are looking at what action we can take uh, to improve that. Brian. Thank you. Just in, uh, back to the delivery of chemotherapy, at the recent annual review there was a, quite a strong cry for a, 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 the consultation in terms of delivery of chemotherapy treatment within Ayrshire to be a public consultation. And you seem to be quite open to that, that, uh, that idea. Uh, uh, are we still in that position? Absolutely. The, um, the paper we take to board will be uh, to, to seek that approval for formal consultation and public consultation and we will do that in a public board meeting. So just to clarify there, that, that won't be a selected uh, number, of, number of the public, that will just be an open public consultation? Yes. Thank you. Just, just for the record, it appears that in the last two years the, the target has, uh, cancer target has been met once, just for the record, uh, in one, sorry, in one month, sorry. Um, uh, Jenny. Thank you, Good morning to the panel. Um, my question is with regard to uh, recruitment and retention. Um, NHS Ayrshire and Arran has a higher consultant vacancy rate in terms of full-time equivalent um, than the figures are nationally. So I think 16% versus 8.5% nationally um, as of June 2017. <laughs> And in written evidence to this committee, uh, Parkinson's UK Scotland stated that there is a critical shortage of consultants in medicine for older people in Ayrshire with nearly half, 47.6% of posts vacant. So I'd like to ask why the consultant rate is higher in Ayrshire and Arran, what's going on? And secondly, what are you doing in terms of uh, attracting people to work in Ayrshire and Arran? Are there any specific things you've been doing? I know, for example, NHS Fife go across to uh, Ireland and they do recruitment drives. What kind of things are you doing to attract people in to fill those vacancies? So the, the consultant vacancy uh, uh, issue in in medicine for the elderly, uh, we are seeking to address. We, we've recently recruited uh, a, a new consultant uh, uh, into uh, our older people's services, but particularly with a focus in acute care, uh, and we think that's an important step. We're also uh, redesigning the, the team around the consultant, so we are uh, looking to bring in um, uh, acute care of the elderly practitioners uh, to support the medical team uh, and, and deliver uh, uh, that service. Uh, um, so it's about change. We're also looking at uh, how we deliver our older people's services uh, to ensure that we're delivering uh, a service that is modern and will attract consultants to come and work in Ayrshire. Uh, in terms of attractiveness, well, firstly, we, uh, across all consultant vacancies, we are uh, looking firstly to promote Ayrshire because we think it's a good place to come and work and live. Um, secondly, we uh, are, are looking to engage in any national uh, initiatives that there are in terms of recruitment. Um, and we are looking to uh, learn uh, from other boards. Other boards, as, as you say, have been looking beyond our shores for recruitment. Mm -hmm. uh, and we're looking to learn from their experience to see uh, if there are different things that we can do 
uh, in terms of attracting consultants uh, to Ayrshire because it is a critical uh, and significant issue for us. Um, Thank you. Yeah. So just, 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 to rest, uh, just come in, um, just to say, uh, 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 John mentioned uh, acute care of the elderly, uh, ACE practitioners. Um, I think in recognition that it has proved difficult to attract um, a full complement of uh, uh, geriatricians. Um, what we've sought to do in collaboration between the partnerships and our acute colleagues is to recruit uh, a number of these practitioners who are uh, essentially senior nursing and AHP staff with additional skills who uh, can fulfil a number of roles to prevent and support uh, to, to, at, at the front end of the hospital, uh, John mentioned, uh, combined assessment unit, uh, working within that to prevent admission to hospital uh, after initial assessment uh, and also to support the discharge working hand in glove with uh, social work and, and senior uh, clinical staff. So I think what we've sought to do is to recognise uh, the difficulties that there are in recruitment uh, and adapt where appropriate. But as John says, um, we are fortunate recently to have, have, have attracted a, a, a consultant uh, to come and work with us. So there are still vacancies, but uh, we're making progress on that. So I, think, I think one of the other things to recognise that there is some evidence, albeit anecdotal at this stage, but, but increasingly uh, clear, that young consultants prefer to live and work in the central belt and, and attracting them to go down to yeah. rural Ayrshire is becoming a, a, an increasing problem. I appreciate that. I represent a constituency in Fife and I recognise that it's difficult to get people into these areas sometimes, particularly young graduates. But um, with regard to that geriatric medicine uh, that you alluded to, um, in terms of the statistics, it shows that over half of the consultant posts for geriatric medicine were vacant and had been vacant for six months or longer. Is that pattern changing? Because if you've got job vacancies sitting there for six months, it suggests that there hasn't been a culture shift. And I appreciate you are trying to put things in place, but you know that's June 2017. Have things improved in the last six months? Yes, I think things have improved in that we have recruited a very good consultant uh, as clinical leader for uh, the service. And, uh, uh, and, and we've worked very hard with uh, our health and social care partnerships to redesign uh, our older people's services so that we are clear about uh, the focus uh, uh, in community and front door assessment. So I think we uh, have a, a, a very different model that we, we would be offering and I think that will be attractive to <coughs> consultants uh, to come and work in. We know that when we can bring uh, potential candidates to Ayrshire and when they meet the team uh, and other t and the, the clinical and other teams, that they, they, uh, they like what they see and hear about Ayrshire uh, and then are keen to come in and, and uh, follow through on their application. Thank you. Okay, uh, Alex, then Emma. Thank you, Convener. I'll come on to the issue of delayed discharge in a minute, if I may, but I have a couple of follow-ups. Firstly, on Colin Smith's question around cancer waiting times and the broader issue of waiting times, we have learned that in recent weeks, that in NHS Lothian in particular, there has been a culture of under-reporting of waiting times and delays, missed indicators. Um, first in St John's in the last 24 hours, we've also seen that in the ERI and the sick kids. Do you have 100% confidence in the fidelity of the statistics that we're seeing before us today? Yes. Very good. Um, secondly, in terms of the uh, picking up on the Ivan's question on improvement, um, in the issue of, for example, cancer waiting times, you talked about diagnostic capacity being a principal reason for those delays. Um, is that something you capture as a matter of course? In terms of right across all of the indicators you've given us today, do you not, uh, routinely capture the reasons for those delays? Yes, we do, and we report them uh, through our uh, board reports to board uh, 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 every public board meeting. And when you have that sort of risk register, as it were, in terms of the delay, uh, the reasons for the delays, the catalyst for the delays, um, do you then, is there a follow-up process where you talk about how you can mitigate those specific reasons? Uh, I'll pick that up, if I yep. may, in the governance uh, side of it. The answer to that is, is yes. We, we ensure, and through Healthcare Governance Committee and then reporting into the board, that there are quality improvement plans or improvement plans in place to mitigate against any of these uh, cases. And there's a very high degree, I would argue, a very high degree of scrutiny uh, through the, the Healthcare Governance Committee 
uh, and then reporting that into board. And uniquely, we have a different, uh, slightly different setup. It, after that, we have uh, the chairs of all the governance committee meet uh, as a group called the Integrated Governance Committee, where we further uh, look at the, the, the key issues of, of, of the, the period. Thank you. Are you happy for me to come in on delayed discharge? Uh, no, not just now. Um, okay. We were trying to stick to retention yeah. and recruitment, so that was a bit cheeky, Alex. But anyway, I was trying to Emma, you, you want to come in on that? Yeah, it's, uh, thank you, convener. It is a recruitment um, question. Last week, Jason Leach talked about how he worked at uh, Greater Glasgow and then spent a day doing clinic and a day doing surgery in Oban. And I'm aware that the urologists from Ayrshire and Arran also support NHS in Fries and Galloway, and same with ENT for Glasgow as well. So... Is there enough opportunities being explored to share the skills across different boards? I mean, if, we're, if we can't recruit for one specific area, can we maybe get people out for two or three days at a time, over a month or whatever? So I think uh, we, we need to, to think more around uh, that type of arrangement. I think regional working, regional delivery uh, will, will uh, give us a chance to do more of that. Uh, but we're already doing some of that in Ayrshire um, in limited ways, but we're also looking to work with neighbouring health boards, and, and you've just given some of the examples where we are assisting some boards, but we, we work closely with Lanarkshire and, and Glasgow where uh, they provide support uh, for us in terms of delivery of service uh, to, to support some. Uh, of the challenges we face, but that's not always uh, uh, a practical solution. Could, could I give a couple of examples around that? So, um, in terms of Glasgow, uh, consultants come down around uh, neurology and neuro, neuro rehab services where we don't have our own consultants. Uh, with Lanarkshire, there's uh, shared arrangements for support of the hyperacute stroke unit, which uh, is at Cross House. So those are examples we're working with uh, neighbouring boards. Uh, we've been able to, to achieve that. I think the other thing I wanted to mention was around skill mix and so forth. So we, we mentioned our, our challenge around uh, consultant radiologists, and we have had vacancies for a long period of time. So we had to look how to redesign those services. Uh, so we have trained a significant, significant number of uh, radiographers, and they are able to do uh, a proportion of the work, which otherwise um, radiologists would have done. And uh, so that's an example of, of redesign and uh, skill mix change. And because of our PAC system that's national for radiography, it means that you can take x-rays by a radiographer, but then it could be interpreted by somebody in another board, for instance, on a Saturday night at midnight. So that, does that work happen as well? So the uh, PAC system allows the images uh, to be shared. Uh, on the back of the national um, shared services work uh, to improve that radiology uh, um, activity, uh, we need to um, have a common radiology information system to then allow those reports to be uh, transferred back. So that's part of a national programme uh, and we're involved in, in, in that. Okay, okay thanks. Um, in relation to recruitment, um, wh when there's a vacancy in Ayrshire and what happens? How, how does that get advertised or how is someone recruited? If it's a medical vacancy, uh, well, for all vacancies, then uh, the uh, department needs to consider if it's a straight replacement. So there's a, there's a natural review uh, of uh, the job. If it's a straight replacement, then uh, we would go to uh, advertise. Uh, for where those posts. Where is it advertised about? Uh, we would advertise on the show website um, for for all appointments, the Scottish Health on the Web. Okay. Um, do you do anything more inventive than that? Anything more creative? I think the, the, the area where and, uh, members of the committee have touched on where we need to be, uh, I think, uh, more creative is, is around medical workforce. I think that for other skills, we continue to be able to recruit uh, to nursing posts, to um, allied health professional posts and others uh, 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 reasonably well. I think the area that is most challenging for us is medical workforce, and that's where we are trying to look uh, in different ways and learn from others to, to see if uh, we can embrace some of, of their work. 
So what, what kind of good examples could you give us then? Maybe just an example around nursing is that we work very closely with the University of West of Scotland who uh, do nurse training. So a high proportion of the uh, people who are going through the University of West of Scotland nurse training end up working for us and, and that's a, a good link in a feeder system for, for nursing. In terms of uh, medical, we have tried uh, a number of things, one of which would be using an agency rather than bringing in a doctor on a short-term basis to ask them to go and see if they can recruit um, for a, a shortage area. That has had limited uh, impact, but those are a couple of examples. Just from the, um, the papers, we see you know big weights and things like for musculoskeletal uh, complaints. So are you doing anything creative or inventive to get... Um, professionals in, fr in that discipline. So, so I'll just pick Anything different? I'll, I'll pick that one up for a start, just again trying to give John a bit of a rest here. So we, we recognised that at the board uh, um, several months ago. I forget which board meeting was discussed at, um, but we picked that up and the whole musculoskeletal unit uh, has been redesigned uh, over that period of time and performance is improving significantly. Uh, I think um, the latest figures John will give you, I don't have them to hand. So yes, there was a recognition through the Healthcare Governance Committee uh, and indeed the, the, the MSK unit themselves recognised that they were underperforming and there's been a full redesign uh, and significantly better outcomes. It, it, part of what you refer to is that it's financial constraints uh, that uh, have been at the core of that and that waiting times are increasing because of financial constraints, does that mean that you're not able to recruit staff? Tim? I think, I think um, uh, at, at uh, one NHS board, we noted that there was improvement in relation to the MSK service, and uh, I can report that we would expect to uh, meet uh, a 90% uh, 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 treatment uh, within four weeks, probably by March this year. That's the trajectory that we've got. Um, I think what we did note was that in order to achieve some targets in relation to savings and efficiencies, there were potential risks in due course. Um, however, in the interim, what we've agreed is, is not to uh, seek to apply uh, the same level of uh, efficiency to the MSK service. So I think having uh, undertaken the redesign, we've seen significant improvement in that. And I think next, next week uh, at the board, we'll see that it, we're now at a 50% uh, achievement of the four-week target. Um, and uh, as I say, I think the issue was one of uh, future risk rather than uh, the actuality. But were vacancies not filled because of financial constraints? That's what it's referred to here. There have been occasions in which we've uh, sought to uh, reduce spend by not filling all vacancies. But I think we agreed that uh, at the end of the day that that was counterproductive. OK. Um, Alison. Thank you, convener. Um, we're aware of the fact that you have had a consistently high rate of emergency admissions um, and that during the past five years <coughs> you've actually had the highest rate of emergency admissions of all 14 uh, territorial health boards. Now, I appreciate that, that you have an older than average population, that you have high levels of smoking, obesity, um, drug and alcohol use, low physical activity and, and low levels of well-being. So you have a lot of challenges which may lead to that initial admission, I understand that, but you also have particularly high levels of multiple admissions where people are returning three or more times. Um, I wonder if you could let us know why that might be the case. So, uh, as, as, as you've described, we have uh, a range of challenges around the health needs of our population. I think that one of the areas that uh, we need to uh, do more work on is around that readmission, so multiple readmissions. We have high levels of chronic conditions in Ayrshire, um, and uh, there is no doubt when we look at the data that causes uh, and is a driver for those uh, multiple admissions. Working with the partnerships, and, and Tim might want to say a bit more about technology enabled care, um, there is strong evidence that if we can use uh, some of the digital technology. We can support individuals to um, have uh, uh, more uh, ownership of their health uh, using uh, home health monitoring, as an example. 
so I think there's uh, quite a bit of opportunity for us in Ayrshire to work more closely with uh, uh, those with chronic conditions and to see how we can support them to manage their health care differently that would avoid multiple hospital admissions. I mean, obviously, having support at home is absolutely key to prevent admission in the first place and, you know, to ensure a, a swift recovery when patients do return home. But do you think there's any link between the multiple admission and the fact that NHS Ayrshire and Arran have amongst the shortest stay um, of any of the health boards in Scotland? You know, patients seem to be in hospital. Uh, you know, are they leaving too quickly? There's, there's no evidence that they're leaving too quickly. Uh, we've looked at readmissions quite carefully, um, and often individuals, well, there is an element, as I've described, around chronic condition and an exacerbation of, of their condition. Um, the the, the multimorbidity, uh, or the, na the, the nature of that, uh, often causes people to be uh, admitted with a, 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 for a different reason. Uh, so we are looking and continue to look very closely at readmissions because we, we recognise that uh, readmissions as an indicator, as a measure uh, of um, uh, how we manage uh, care uh, through our hospital system. But there's nothing coming forward that would suggest that uh, people are being discharged too early. OK. I mean, you'll be expecting increased admissions over this winter period and what you know what measures have you got in place to deal with that expected increase so one of the the the, the partnerships have a range of measures and tim will maybe touch on those in a moment um, in the hospital uh, uh, service uh, particularly around uh, uh, university hospital crosshouse uh, we've done a lot of change our combined assessment units are a key part um, and, and pr provide, uh, a, 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 I say turnaround, there's never a good way to describe this, but in managing the care of individuals, they're able to uh, return people back home uh, um, uh, as, and avoid admission uh, uh, with quite high levels uh, of, of success in doing that. Uh, but we are going to introduce, with the, just referring back to the um, uh, older people's physician that, that we've just recruited, uh, we will introduce a, uh, an extension uh, to that assessment unit process uh, with, uh, I think it's 12 extra assessment beds specifically for older people to give the, uh, the new consultant and those um, practitioners that we've described uh, the space to provide that rapid assessment and to seek to avoid unnecessary admission to hospital, and we think that's an important aspect. Um, but maybe Tim would like to talk about some of the work the partnerships are doing. Maybe um, uh, two, two, uh, two or three levels, um, just in terms of uh, responding perhaps to the earlier uh, uh, query about um, supporting people at home and the whole issue around about self-management. Because at the end of the day, uh, the issues around about winter and delayed discharges and so on, w what we need to do, it seems to me, is to work with, with local communities, with individuals, to uh, assist them with self-care. And John made mention, for example, uh, of the work that we're doing in relation to home and mobile health monitoring, use of uh, technology to enable people to self-care. Um, anticipatory care activity with, with GP practice, um, where what we're seeking to do is to use um, uh, a, a, a variety of indicators to enable the multidisciplinary team meeting within the, the GP practice, and that includes uh, social work and other staff, uh, to identify people early who may, may need support. Um, Clearly, there are circumstances, and, and, and we, we haven't cracked the issue of people turning up at hospital more frequently, clearly, than, than, than in other localities. Um, what we obviously need to do is to seek to manage that demand as effectively as possible. And um, uh, I, I, clearly, from our perspective in South Asia, and I, I imagine in, in relation to my colleagues in North as well, um, we do have concerns about delayed discharge because that does impact on the system's ability to, uh, to, to manage that demand. Um, for us, uh, a significant uh, strand of our winter planning is trying to uh, identify some additional capacity for home care, which is, is where we're struggling uh, most in a, in a South Asia context. Um, and, and perhaps in, in, in relation to the earlier questioning in relation to uh, recruitment and retention, we, we actually held a, 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 a job fair recently, uh, attracting as seeking to attract as many people as we could to uh, job fair to, to come and work as, as home care. 
carers uh, within South Ayrshire and that took place two or three weeks ago. We've been able to uh, 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 speed up appropriately the process of recruitment uh, and um, uh, a number of people are already uh, in, in induction um, uh, over, the, uh, over this, this week and next week. Um, we've also, for example, uh, sought uh, additional uh, capacity from our private providers. We've put out a, a further contract, uh, tender contract to them, and I'm hopeful that uh, a provider will start to provide additional capacity in the uh, in 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 January. So. Over and above that, we do have a range of uh, initiatives and act activity that are designed to uh, uh, support people to return home as if, as as, as uh, quickly as possible. We do have capacity issues both in terms of home care and care homes. Um, our care homes are, are running. Uh, that's across uh, the, the largely the private sector. Uh, they're largely running at, at, at almost 100% uh, capacity at the moment. Uh, so obviously our objective is to maintain people within their own homes. Um, but uh, there's a range of activity. One area uh, that I didn't mention is the uh, intermediate care team. I think most uh, most partnerships will have a multidisciplinary team working, uh, allied health professionals and social work working within the hospital to both support discharge and uh, 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 minimise uh, admission and so on. So a range of activities for the winter. I think just to complement that, uh, Tim's talking about South Ayrshire and, and rightly so. North Ayrshire are also in the process and have recruited additional uh, resource. I think they've taken is it 21, 20 or 21 additional people in for uh, home care. So that will help to address the, the problems in, in the north as well. Okay, thank you. Thank you, convener. Okay, hey, Alex. Thank you, convener. Um, moving to delayed discharge, um, we, we know from meeting with the Royal College of Emergency Physicians, for example, that delayed discharge is often the principal cause of delays in A&E. In fact, it represents an interruption in flow throughout the health care journey. Um, what are the barriers in social care within your territorial area that cause problems in getting people out of hospital, and what are you doing to mitigate them? Yes, the, the, the two main issues for us uh, at the moment are capacity downstream uh, in terms of uh, care homes. Um, we uh, are, I think as of yesterday, um, year on year we've, we've seen an increase in terms of the numbers of placements that we're funding in care homes. Um, we obviously uh, have a good relationship with a range of providers or all of the providers in South Asia. Uh, we work uh, hand in glove with them. Uh, uh, to uh, manage as best we can the capacity and demand, but uh, you know, largely uh, the places are full, uh, and um, uh, it had been uh, certainly our strategic ambition to try and uh, manage down uh, the number of people that ended up in care homes, and there are there are circumstances in which uh, we believe if we were able to intervene more quickly, uh, we could prevent a deterioration. I think there is good evidence to suggest that if uh, uh, older people are in hospital any longer than 72 hours or so, uh, their, their risk of ending up in, in a care home is, is higher. Um, I think to some extent our ability to achieve that ambition to, to uh, speed people's discharge has been a, as a consequence of our inability to provide home care timiously. Um, and uh, as I was saying earlier in response to the, to the earlier uh, question, um, we're seeking to increase our capacity within home care and to manage that capacity more effectively. Um, we've introduced a, a reablement service and again most other, there was earlier questions around about learning from, from one partnership to another. I think there's, there's good learning across Scotland. Uh, reablement uh, is uh, uh, a, a way of uh, supporting people early in their uh, time within uh, home care uh, with a view to helping them uh, rather than simply, for instance, uh, um, uh, help, uh, them being helped to, 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 to bathe or toilet or whatever, uh, to support them to do that for themselves and therefore need less service moving on. Uh, we recently introduced that service. Um, we still need to, uh, I suppose, see the full effects of that. So two things going on. One, trying to use our home care uh, capacity more effectively, but also adding to uh, the total uh, home care capacity. Um, I think there's some, f for us, in terms of our thinking strategically moving forward, in terms of uh, commissioning plans, um, 
I think we need to understand better the data uh, in relation to the local population, uh, particularly in South Asia. Um, I think uh, uh, the demographic characteristics are quite unusual, I think we're beginning to establish. There's relatively high deprivation, but relatively high number of older people uh, as well, and a, a much smaller uh, group of, of, of people of working age. The dependency ratio is very high uh, in, in South Asia. And, and as we begin to kind of reflect on, well, what to do with the entire system, delayed discharges are simply a, are simply a symptom of the system not working in the way that we want. Um, what, what we would want to do, I think, as we, as we look at commissioning moving forward is to understand, well, what are the future demands likely to be and manage our service in that way. Thank you, but I may have a follow-up. Um, I think I fully understand, and I think your situation is replicated across all yes. the 14 health boards, boards, particularly residential care capacity. Um, in terms of home care, though, um, I'm always struck by the tension that still exists, even despite integration, between the willingness of a health board to spend four or five hundred pounds a night to keep somebody in hospital, um, but then social care directorate not willing to spend 150 pounds a day or night for um, home care at home. Um, is, is that attention you're familiar with? Is, is that a re reality? And secondly, is there a capacity issue in terms of recruitment and retention of social care workers being able to provide that care on the ground? If, if, if I deal with the, the, the second issue first and then move on to the, the, the first issue, the, the, in terms of um, uh, uh, recruitment, uh, yes, it is. It, it is an issue. Um, I think we were pleasantly surprised, though, uh, that the recent uh, job fair that we held, that so many people uh, came forward uh, to to work in our uh, effectively our in-house uh, council managed service. The risk, of course, is that we attract people from the private sector, um, and uh, we do know that a number of the applicants are coming from the private sector. So all you're doing is moving the capacity from <coughs> potentially one place to to, to another. Um, however, that's not that, that's not only the case. I think I think moving forward, uh, I think, and we won't be unusual as a partnership. Um, I think perhaps some of our thinking uh, needs to change. I think that there's much more that we will need to do as a community and families to support uh, people. Uh, I think using uh, using the assets uh, of communities in the widest sense, uh, I think is very much at the, the forefront of what health and social care partnerships will, will want to do. Um, but uh, some of the traditional models are simply, we're simply not going to have the bodies to, to do the work. I do accept that. And uh, uh, we'll obviously, uh, as with other partnerships, continue to monitor that. Um, the, the point in relation to uh, the, the resourcing of, of beds and, and uh, as, as opposed to care homes or care at home, I think is, is understood. Um, I think we have made progress. So, for instance, in South Asia, um, we have uh, recognised, for example, we, we've got a, a com one of the community hospitals in, in South Asia um, where uh, we underdid some uh, quite significant demand and capacity work, looked at uh, the role and function of the community hospital determined that it's its best function, um, given that NHS continuing care really now doesn't exist, its best function was palliative and uh, rehabilitative uh, uh, capacity. Uh, and as a consequence, what we've done is to close a ward there and use the resources from that uh, for care at home and care home provision. I think it's more difficult when we're talking about uh, acute hospital care, and uh, John and, and Derek may wish to come in on that, because I don't, I don't think it's easy to simply take the resource out uh, and move it uh, to, to social care. But where possible, uh, those changes can be made. Anyone else? Want, John, do you want to come in? Well, I, I, uh, I think Tim makes the point about it, uh, and I think well around uh, the work done in the community. I think it is more difficult when you get to acute care. Um, and when we look at Ayrshire, as has uh, been, been uh, commented on, the levels of uh, need are high. Um, I think what we uh, are striving to do with our partnerships is to manage that need, um, to, to bring the demand down. I think the, the, uh, as this evolves and, and strategic plans develop, um, if we start to see in the, you know, in the future that there is a substantive shift from hospitals, into community provision, then I think that you can start to uh, address that issue. But I think just now the risk 
and the demands are so great in terms of managing acute care uh, that we are, we are uh, not in a position where we are having uh, uh, that discussion about shift from hospital, acute hospital uh, to partnership. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Ryan, did you want in on this, top, this issue? Um, could I, I mean, the whole premise, the financial premise, uh, uh, integration is about moving that money from acute into the community. Are you saying that that is not realistic? It's not happening? It won't happen? Or, or won't it happen without transitional cash? Well, I think, I think uh, I'm, uh, I'm probably saying two things. I think, firstly, um, we need to uh, stabilise, uh, and talking about Ayrshire here, we need to stabilise the acute system. Um, and we need to transform how we work and how we deliver care. Um, when I look mean? at the... What does that mean? Well, I think we need to... Uh, when we look at the population need, what we're trying to do is identify and, and with our partnerships and work together uh, across the entire Ayrshire system uh, to understand what changes could be made. And we've touched on some of them around technology and the use of digital to help support individuals in their home. Uh, but at this point, given the demands, I don't see uh, the uh, opportunity to shift uh, money uh, from the acute hospital provision into community. I do think, however, that as we go forward, one of the um, uh, challenges that we have is to make sure it's strategic planning uh, that partnerships uh, are responsible for uh, takes uh, uh, a, a very close uh, view of um, demand uh, and, and if over time we can see that shift then we would uh, uh, respond accordingly but I, I don't see that as an immediate and I think anything we do needs to be risk assessed because to destabilise the acute system I think uh, would put too much risk into patient care. I think the second point that you make, convener, around transformational funds, um, I think that we have the Integrated Care Fund, which provides some of that transformational opportunity. But I do think, uh, and, and Ayrshire is developing a transformational plan, I do think that, that we would need to see uh, some uh, transformational funds to make that uh, uh, step change. Uh, into the community because you need robust and resilient community services before you can consider uh, those shifts. Did you so can, you know, make, can I just add a rider to that? I think uh, the Chief Executive <coughs> has made that point clear, but I'd just like to emphasise that the Chairs Group, when we meet, have also uh, made a very similar point on transformational change. Transformational change will only happen uh, effectively when uh, there is uh, sufficient resource put in place to, to support that. The common view, the chairs of all the boards. Yes. Okay. Um, anybody else want to come in and delay just discharge issues? No. Um, okay. Uh, Emma. Thank you. Um, I'm going to focus a wee bit around uh, complaints and complaints procedures. Last week, Tracy Gillis, who's NHS Lothian's uh, chief medical officer, talked about patient experience, and uh, poor experience is what leads to complaints. And I know we've implemented changes around the complaints procedure so that feedback is more of a focus because there's complaints, concerns, comments and even compliments now and again. So um, I'm looking at the complaints uh, document, the NHS Ayrshire and Aaron, um, experience uh, annual report. And it talks about things that you've put in place like what matters to you and compassionate connections programme and obtaining feedback in different ways. So I would be interested to, to hear your thoughts about why there's a 20-day working day response which isn't being met. And I'm just reading that some of it is because the complainants are requesting face-to-face -face meetings and that can be a challenge to, you know, for diaries and bookings. So that might be one reason why the 20-day um, resolution isn't being met. So... Ayrshire has, um, before the new complaints, uh, model complaints procedure was brought into uh, uh, to being, Ayrshire had been reviewing its complaints processes. Um, we wanted to be more responsive to patients and we introduced um, uh, as, a, as a fundamental premise that wherever someone complains, uh, we should seek to afford them the opportunity of a meeting, if that's what they wish. Because the evidence we had 
showed very clearly that if we uh, enabled a face-to-face -face discussion with uh, the individual uh, and staff, then there was a, a greater chance of resolution uh, for the individual um, and learning uh, for the team. So that leads to two things, I think, in terms of the 20-day target. Um, firstly, I think I would agree with you. Um, it's important that we do this at a time that is appropriate for the, uh, the complainant uh, or their family um, and that we don't rush it just to, to meet a deadline. Um, there can be challenges around trying to bring staff and, 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 and uh, uh, given clinical commitments, but we, we commit to that uh, and we look to do that as quickly as possible. So it can contribute to delay, but I think and believe that the, as long as it's done in conjunction uh, with the, the patient and, and, and their family or uh, where that's uh, uh, appropriate um, and, and they're happy with that, um, uh, then I think that's the right thing to do to have that face-to-face -face conversation. I think sometimes, though, the, the, the second reason that we can get into, uh, uh, and, and again, uh, we should always strive to meet and, and keep the communication uh, with, with the complainant, is that um, often complaints that are written uh, can be quite complex, uh, and therefore it can take uh, um, a bit longer to give a full and comprehensive response uh, to a family or an individual. Um, again, uh, we would always seek to do that within the, the target and if we can't, to then keep the complainant informed so they are aware uh, of what's going on and when they can expect a response. Okay, um, the top five complaint themes are communication, attitude behaviour, clinical treatment and appointment date, which is, so obviously there's a range of um, feedback or complaints, you know, right from the wrong site surgery type thing, which is really, really rare. But looking at the communication and the attitude and that, can you tell us a wee bit more about some of the aspects around the complaints, which makes it really difficult to, I guess, meet the, meet the, the deadlines for, for the complaint response? Well, I think the ones, that, the, the, the themes you've referred to around communication um, are, are ones that we would seek to address within the 20 days. Um, the ones that I think take a bit longer is where an individual is uh, concerned about the clinical care they've had um, and there may be a range of issues within that where we need to speak to a range of professionals to be able to bring together a comprehensive response for that individual. Um, so uh, I would, uh, I, I am very clear that, that um, you know, where we can respond in 20 days then we are absolutely committed to doing that. And as I say, uh, things like communication are areas where we, we should be able to do that. Okay, thanks. Okay, uh, Miles. Uh, thank you, Convener, and good morning to the panel. Um, one of the areas which you highlighted in the information you gave to the um, committee was the higher than average levels of smoking in Ayrshire and Arran. I think you specifically 22.7% um, smoke compared to 20.2. So I wanted to know what work um, the board was doing to, to increase uptake of smoking cessation. Our, our, again, this is um, uh, an area led on by our public health team. Um, they, they, through the smoking cessation program um, and, and indeed working in health improvement, and Tim might have something to, to add to this, um, but, but through uh, local activity, uh, to support uh, individuals that want to uh, stop smoking. The smoking cessation program is the key focus. I don't have detail with me uh, on the specifics around the smoking cessation program. And again, uh, I would be happy to provide the committee with that detail. That'd be helpful. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think to add to that, I think probably just to uh, provide f uh, information afterwards. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe one thing to mention is things like nicotine mm -hmm. replacement therapy patches and so forth, and using those and making them available to patients and patients as well. That may be a, uh, an yeah. area. If you could provide us with that detail, it would be helpful. Um, the government's um, continuously telling us that the health boards are working towards making a parity between mental health and physical health. And looking through the information you provided us, I found two paragraphs totaling 119 words outlining many of the problems. So I just wondered if you could outline to us how big an issue is mental health 
for you and your board and what work are you doing to, to deliver that parity between service? I'll, I'll say something. Um, in terms of in terms of mental health and well-being, um, clearly that's a very significant focus of the work that we're undertaking within localities, within each of the four. Uh, sorry, four, uh, within each of the three um, uh, partnerships in uh, Ayrshire and Arran. Um, and uh, again, probably to uh, in, in terms of the specifics, um, I suppose they've, they've actually gone out of my head at the moment. <laughs> in I, I terms of what up, we're doing, I looked up your heat target, which yeah. suggests that seventy-six percent of people in June were only seen within the eighteen-week target. So, what work's going on to try to improve that? Yep. Sorry, I, I think probably there are two issues that are um, foremost in my mind here. One is health and uh, mental health well-being. Uh, and then obviously there's a mental health service for people with uh, severe and enduring uh, mental health problems. Um, that, I have to say, is is largely uh, led um, by my colleagues uh, from North Asia. Um, I'm not uh, absolutely clear in terms of the uh, achievement of target at this particular stage, and we could provide you with some more information after the after the, uh, the session, unless, John, you've got something. The, uh, the two targets around uh, child lives and mental health and psychological therapies. So I can um, advise the committee that in terms of child and adolescent mental health, uh, they've been performing uh, above target in terms of the 18-week measure. Um, and, and they've been improving. And I have to say that's very much a good example of where integration uh, has seen child and, child and adolescent mental health services work with other agencies, other partners, and redesign and work differently to contribute to that improvement. And we see strength across Ayrshire in that area. Psychological therapies, we've been uh, conducting a, a, f a review of our psychological services. Um, we were concerned at the performance, not just the performance, but we felt that we needed to review um, and change that, that service. That work is underway. Um, and the latest figures I have for psychological therapies, which covers a wide range of interventions, um, is uh, a performance of 87%. Uh, and so we're seeing a marked improvement um, in that area. Still not at target, and therefore there is still work to do. I think in terms, if I may, in terms of the wider mental health, so <coughs> Tim is right, there is a, a, the, I mean, mental health and well-being is um, a, a priority issue in Ayrshire. We know it's one of those areas that um, is, is uh, raised consistently uh, by citizens in terms of an area of concern. Uh, there is work going on within the partnerships, but I think importantly we, we have a pan-Ayrshire approach uh, to mental health services. We, um, opened a new inpatient facility recently, which has transformed the inpatient experience uh, for those that require an inpatient stay. But we've also been continuing to develop um, community services. Um, primary care mental health is a particular area of focus uh, and a continued priority for us. Thank you. In terms of the things that went out of my head before, um, the uh, w one of the significant areas of focus for us uh, clearly is is within uh, the localities uh, where uh, isolation and loneliness have been uh, raised as as concerns. And clearly, what we would be looking to do um, is to work with local people to identify opportunities for people to come together and have social interaction, um, but at a, a slightly uh, a, a, a more clinical level, um, each of the partnerships within Ayrshire and Arran uh, with, with uh, funding from the Integrated Care Fund and from the Scottish Government um, have put in place community link workers, uh, they'll, they'll be called different things in other places, um, who support GP practice with people, uh, the needs of people who have relatively low level uh, mental health uh, needs uh, and so on. And perhaps the other, the, the one other area that I, that I would mention from an Ayrshire and Arran perspective is that um, we've recently uh, been rolling out the use of electronic CBT therapy. So for people with relatively uh, low-level uh, mental health uh, issues, uh, encouraging GPs to, uh, uh, to prescribe, if you like, uh, or to refer on for uh, that type of uh, online uh, assistance and so on, rather than uh, necessarily clinical therapy, medical, th uh, sorry, uh, pharmaceutical Suitable therapies, uh, drugs in the first instance, uh, and I think there's uh, some really good evidence from across Scotland that that's likely to improve people's well-being overall. Just have a very 
small supplementary. In terms of every GP in your health board area, are they trained and have access to the Alice system then in that case? If that would be where the referral was being made. To the which system? The Alice Network. The Alice system, yeah, so, so the Alice system uh, is a, it, it, I, I assume that you're referring to the directory of, of services and so on. Actually, each of the partnerships in, in Ayrshire and Arran um, have, I think, certainly sent it's the case for us and I, I, I think for, for East and North, we've been working with each of our uh, voluntary sector, third sector interface uh, organisations to develop, I think, more bespoke or more local uh, access uh, uh, directories and so on that fulfil the same uh, function as Alice. Whether or not GPs have direct access to it, I'm not, uh, in all honesty, clear. Um, but certainly the community link workers uh, are the people who are probably best placed to put people in touch with, uh, with local services uh, at, at that sort of uh, more informal or non-statutory level. OK, thank you. OK, thank you. Brian? Convener, I should have declared at the start, Convener, that uh, I have a, an interest in that I'm a close family member who works within Ayrshire and Arran, so apologies for not doing that at the start. I'd like to touch on the reporting of significant adverse events. And, and forgive me if I've got the years slightly out of kilter here, but I think between 2010 and 2013 there was 54 uh, reported, uh, and that's running roughly at 18 a year. For the next three years it went to zero, three and four. Now that's a significant change, and I just wonder who monitors uh, the significant adverse event numbers and what investigation would those changes initiate? So the uh, adverse event reviews in Ayrshire, perhaps just say, give a little bit of context in terms of answering the question, if I may. So since 2012, um, we have uh, uh, had a continuous um, improvement process around significant adverse events in Ayrshire um, on the back of a review by Healthcare Improvement Scotland in 2012. So that's the basis in which we have uh, continued to, to look, to review and learn from our process. Uh, in terms of, <coughs> if I can maybe take the, uh, the, the, the point around um, who monitors, uh, we have <coughs> uh, different levels in the organisation where adverse event reviews are regularly reviewed and monitored. So the first is at the directorate level, at the Adverse Event Review Group, where directors and, and, and uh, members of the, 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 the directorate team uh, have a responsibility for reviewing uh, the progress and delivery and improvement around adverse event reviews. Uh, that is then reported uh, through our Risk Management Committee, uh, which is chaired by myself, so that we look at the number of adverse event reviews, we're looking at the learning that comes from adverse event reviews. And then that is reported to the Healthcare Governance Committee. And each adverse event review um, is uh, a significant adverse event review is reported to the Healthcare Governance Committee. Uh, the uh, action plan is reported uh, and the committee hold uh, myself and fellow directors to account for the delivery of that improvement and to demonstrate uh, learning. And one of the things that we have uh, been developing uh, is the use of learning notes uh, as a way of sharing uh, more widely uh, uh, the learning from adverse events. Okay, thank you. For such a significant drop uh, in the reporting of or, or the instigation of uh, adverse or significant adverse events review, there are only two things in my mind that can happen. That's either you've implemented change that has hugely improved outcomes, which would be fantastic, or you've changed what constitutes an adverse event, if you'd like to comment. We, as part of our review uh, back in 2012-13, uh, looked uh, very closely at the definitions, the national definitions, so what categorised uh, a significant adverse event review, uh, as opposed to an adverse event review, uh, or an adverse event. Um, so we uh, and we brought in clarity uh, to Ayrshire around those definitions, and that did have an impact on the, the total numbers of significant adverse event reviews that were uh, initiated. But it also meant that there was uh, 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 an increase in um, other reviews uh, that were uh, uh, as part of the wider definition. Um, and everything is recorded through our Datix system. So we are able to look uh, at how 
all events, uh, all adverse events, however uh, scored and rated, um, are uh, reviewed uh, and, and addressed. Significant adverse event reviews in our process um, uh, would be, or, or where one was requested, would be submitted to the medical or nurse director uh, for a final decision as to whether that should be a significant adverse event review. And since 2012, we've kept that under review. Um, and we continue to keep that definition under review. But we believe we're working in line with the, uh, the, 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 the definitions that um, exist for uh, significant and other reviews. Would you accept then there's, there's a huge disparity between health boards in terms of the numbers of adverse events, the significant adverse events that are reported? So would that suggest to me there's an autonomy within health boards to define what a significant adverse event review is? Well, I think the, uh, as I say, there is a, a definition, um, but I, I, of course we would then uh, look to score. We would use a, a, a scoring method to determine um, whether that adver whether that event, that adverse event, merited. Um, I can't speak for the other territorial boards. Um, I can, uh, I assume they will have similar systems and processes to the ones we have in Ayrshire. If I could just do a, a, a related one to that, I think one of the th you know you know that there was a uh, health improvement Scotland review of the neonatal Nathan, Nathan unit in Cross House, and, and one of those the outcomes of that was looking at uh, sort of a, a reading of the CTG monitors was a major contributor to to uh, preventable uh, baby deaths. And out the back of that, there seemed to be a, an indication that mandatory <coughs> CTG training across the neonatal unit would be implemented twice a year. I just wanted to confirm if if that is the case. So the, the review in Tertiary Maternity Unit concluded, and certainly CTG training was an aspect uh, of that. Um, our response to, to that has been to do a full training needs analysis uh, across our maternity services, of which CTG training uh, is, is uh, part of that training needs analysis, and to introduce uh, and make sure we comply with the recommendations that were brought through in that report, uh, including uh, CTG training. So is it mandatory now? Is it mandatory that CTG training is taken part by all neonatal unit uh, workers? CD, CTG training um, was uh, carried out in Ayrshire. Um, but what this was, uh, if, if I recall the recommendation, and I'm happy to provide the detail, mm. um, it, it, it was how uh, teams come together, uh, you know, the clinical teams come together and train together. Uh, so we were doing CTG training, but this was to... Uh, I think develop that further. I, I'm happy. I just don't have. I just can't recall the detail to mind. But I'm very happy to provide that detail for you because I know we have it. I, I can help you if you like. <laughs> um, because I know CTG training was was available, mm -hmm. uh, but there was a, a, the report suggested that, that that was not taken up because it was supposed to be done within uh, the private time of, of healthcare professionals, and the recommendation was that CTG training would then be, be um, available during. Uh, working time, and then it would be mandatory uh, to all neonatal workers uh, twice a year, and and that's the information that I've been given by, I think the cabinet secretary will have to check that up. I just wanted to clarify if that is actually the case. We are implementing the recommendations, and CTG training is part of that, uh, and making sure that all uh, our maternity staff undertake uh, appropriate CTG training. Um, and uh, that will be part of our training needs assessment. Um, we use mandatory, and uh, you know, we have a suite of mandatory training, and each discipline uh, has uh, its own mandatory training. Uh, we are very clear that CTG training in Ayrshire needs to be uh, addressed and delivered and provided for all of our maternity staff. You can clarify... And I will clarify the position. That if the position is as Mr Whittle suggests it is, or whether there's a difference from that. Yeah, okay. I just can't recall it, but I will clarify. There's a number of things we need to follow yeah. up on follow in our exchanges today, so we'll include that in the list. Okay. Um, could I ask in relation... Any any others on that issue? Anybody else wants to come in on those issues? No? Okay. In relation to uh, finance, the, um, the, the board did a requirement to deliver cash efficiencies, it's, um, as you would describe them, cuts as I would describe them, of 20 million. Um, will you achieve that? 
Um, so the the uh, target for cash releasing efficiency savings in the current year is twenty five million pounds, mm -hmm. um, and uh, there are challenges around that. So we have already secured uh, about eighteen or nineteen million of that. The remaining. Uh, balance of that uh, is not yet secured. So, for example, uh, we, we talked earlier about the musculoskeletal service and the, the AHP um, uh, numbers there. The, the uh, cash releasing efficiency savings planned around that area have been deferred because of the potential impact on services. So, in some areas, there are uh, replanning around some of the areas of, of cash releasing efficiency savings. And Audit Scotland identified you know, unspecified savings, quite significant unspecified savings. Is that is that a sensible way to proceed, where you just stick a number in and say, well, we hope to get it somehow? Um, ideally, we would identify the savings in advance of the, the start of the new year, and there is ongoing work in a number of areas. So, for example, around prescribing, uh, working ongoing this year will identify next year's savings and within individual directorates and teams uh, as they go through a year. Uh, it was mentioned earlier where a vacancy arises and assessment is carried out to say is it necessary to, to fill that. If it's not necessary to fill it then that can contribute towards uh, next year's efficiency savings. So ideally you would want them all identified before this, the start of the financial year. The rea reality is that we have not been in that position and indeed on some occasions uh, there has been non-recurring uh, savings identified but then they need to be found on a recurring basis in future years. So that is a challenge. And in the report it says the revenue plan approved by the board was for 13.2 million deficit. It's now projected to be over 20 million. Um, can you maybe comment on that? Yeah, so the, the 13.2 million deficit um, was projected in our local delivery plan for 2016-17. Uh, in 2016-17, there were significant recurring cost pressures related to a change in national insurance contributions, which uh, cost about £7 million extra for us. Uh, there was uh, about a 10% increase in prescribing costs, and we also invested in a number of uh, areas uh, which have been touched on. So, for example, uh, radiology, we invested an extra one and a half million pounds to increase the capacity based on demand and capacity analysis. And we, we also identified uh, three million pounds extra for nursing, um, of which 800,000 went into mental health services, a million into maternity services and the rest into acute services. So we had a, a very big challenge in 2016-17 and projected that we would have a 13.2 million deficit in that year. Through non-recurring means, we were able to get back to a break-even position in 2016-17. However, in 2017-18, the, the uh, investments that I mentioned earlier are having their full cost and so although at the beginning of the year we projected a deficit of 13.2 million things have moved in the wrong direction this year and one of the major aspects of that is the additional unscheduled care beds that we have had to open in both of our acute hospitals because of the the demand so that will increase our uh, overspend by uh, in excess of six million pounds there so we that what we are projecting is a deficit in the current financial year and your target was seven and a half million the sorry target, our, our, according to the um, performance standards, the target was a uh, 7.5 million deficit and it's now going to be what? No, our, our target was 13.2 million but it may be the phasing of that in terms of where we would be at, at a particular point in the year. Perhaps at the, the date you're looking at that may have been at September or October, the end of September or October we projected to be overspent by 7.5 million. Um, so we expect the the, out, uh, the the final outcome to be around twenty million pounds of a deficit this year. Okay, and what happens then? 
Well, we're in a uh, discussion with Scottish Government regarding uh, brokerage, um, and that's a, a mechanism whereby the Scottish Government uh, would effectively loan us money to cover that £20 million. We are continuing with our efforts to address <coughs> the, the, the deficit, so we're minimising expenditure where we can, but without impacting frontline services. And we have a transformation programme which um, is identifying areas where we could uh, re release uh, cash releasing, further cash releasing efficiency savings. So there is ongoing work around all of that, um, striving to, to minimise the level of deficit and uh, working uh, also with some of our, our uh, nationally in things like sustainability and value, uh, which is a, a national areas looking at workforce, looking at prescribing, looking at shared services, et cetera. Okay, Ivan, do you want to come in? Yeah, can, I, can I just give yeah. the, the assurance to you as a committee <coughs> from the board that the board looks at this in depth in a number of ways. We have board workshops, we have various other mechanisms. Uh, we have one of our non-executives, the vice chair that is, is on the transformation uh, group. Uh, and so we have a number of ways we're, we're, we're monitoring this uh, and, and together with the chief executive and his exec team, uh, I think on behalf of the board, I can give the assurance that we are uh, uh, working hard to try and make sure we continue to deliver the safe service that we want to deliver within the resources that we have. So the question then is: Is it, is it a failure? Is it a failure of financial planning, or do you simply just not have enough money to run the service? Well, I think the finance, the Ch uh, director of finance, has indicated the areas of, of financial pressure for us. I mean, if you want just to reiterate those no. again. No, uh, no, no, no. Uh, what I'm asking you is: Do you have enough money to run the service? <coughs> Straightforward. I mean, it can only be a yes or no. So, so I'll let the chief executive answer that. He's, he's got the. You're the chair. He's the accountable officer for, for the organisation. I don't think it is as simple as a straight yes or no. Um, what what we uh, are uh, clear on is that there are pressures, and Derek's alluded to unscheduled care that we need to change. I think what this is about is recognising we're at a position where. Uh, we need to address some of the underlying pressures, so around medical workforce, around unscheduled care. Uh, we also understand that with the demands on our system, <coughs> we need to redesign and deliver that differently in a way that delivers better value uh, for the, 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 the money that we have, and that's across the whole system. Uh, and we need to continue to look at areas of best value. I think it, it, is, it is more difficult than it has has ever been, uh, but that's not to say that we uh, should not be uh, still trying to drive through uh, uh, efficiencies and change uh, where we can. So I don't think the, the I, I think that it isn't for me a yes no. It is very much about what we as a board are trying to do to deliver improvement and change, um, uh, whilst at the same time trying to continue to deliver a service. Ivan, yeah, thanks. That was a very brief question. Just to put it all in context. Did, can you tell me how much your budget was in 2016-17 and how much it is in 2017-18? Um, okay, so our, um, our, our cash limited budget is about £680 million pounds, and that would have increased by uh, about £10 million pounds in 17-18 and of that increase, uh, m most of that increase is earmarked for social care services. So um, that that is passed across uh, to to invest in social care. So in, you're saying in cash terms there was no increase. About ten ten million 10 pounds million. of an increase. Right. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Ash. Thank you. Good morning. Um, I just want to ask you about any work that you're undertaking around the preventative agenda, because obviously we know this is a very important area, particularly um, considering you know the deprivation profile of Ayrshire as well. And we know that if we get it right and we spend the money preventatively, you know, that can um, result in effective savings, you know, into the medium term. <coughs> um, in your paper, you said that you're intending to implement a range of high impact targeted interventions. So I'm wondering if you can explain to us what areas you've identified and what programmes you're planning on undertaking. Yes, I mean, I, I, I suppose earlier on uh, referenced the fact that, uh, for example, um, 
where people have uh, long-term conditions, there are ways of managing those in a more effective fashion than we do at the moment. Uh, looking, for example, at uh, self-management, uh, the use of technology and so on, uh, in order to uh, prevent them uh, requiring uh, the use of hospital services. Um, but even before that, uh, there's a wide range of activity that our colleagues within uh, public health and health improvement are supporting uh, each of the three uh, partnerships with. Um, what I would, uh, I suppose, go on to say is that um, for our purposes in, in South Asia, and I think it's probably this case in, in East and North as well, uh, the Community Planning Partnership has a significant role, uh, it seems to me, in looking at uh, prevention. Um, so, in, in, again, in the South, South Asia uh, context, uh, I chair a strategic health and, and well-being group. Uh, as recently as last week, um, we heard uh, proposals that have been jointly developed by the partnership uh, and our colleagues within uh, the, uh, the leisure services within the council uh, to develop a, 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 a healthy, uh, I can't remember the, the, the term that we used, but uh, it's essentially a healthy activity uh, act, you know, program uh, across uh, partners and we expect them to come back with proposals within the next uh, two or three months in terms of how each of the uh, contributors to community planning uh, might make a contribution to uh, active, active citizenship uh, and so on. So um, there are, it seems to me, a number of levels at which we're trying to uh, undertake prevention, trying where possible to uh, prevent demand, uh, manage demand in a more effective way, reduce uh, circumstances in which the state needs to intervene. And I mentioned before, obviously, the work uh, of uh, the uh, community link workers within GP practice, for instance, seeking to get people involved in uh, more informal uh, activities. Um, one specific example that, uh, that, that uh, if I may, might mention is uh, uh, the dementia-friendly uh, towns in, in uh, both Prestwick and in Troon, um, where, where local people, uh, the local uh, locality planning group and other businesses and so on, are seeking to uh, support uh, people with, with dementia, uh, include them, uh, increase their and improve their resilience uh, and that of their carers. And I think that those seem to me to be uh, the sorts of activities that we're going to need to, to major on over, over the coming period to reduce uh, demand down and manage it more effectively. So I was just going to say that in terms of preventing avoidable illnesses, can you tell me which illnesses you've identified and what specific interventions regarding them you're planning? So I think that um, just, if I might just make a, an additional call, I think that the point about community planning is incredibly important. Um, and across Ayrshire, and I sit on uh, all three community planning partnerships, there's a very strong prevention agenda um, looking uh, uh, across a, a whole range of, of uh, inequality and, 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 and change. Uh, so I think that, that, that is important. I think the area that we've been talking about uh, in Ayrshire uh, with our public health team of late is diabetes. Right. Uh, and they need to have uh, a very key focus around um, uh, gestational diabetes um, and around trying to uh, work with and improve uh, the, the type 2 diabetes. Uh, so that's an area that within our work uh, we are looking to bring forward because we believe that there are significant benefits um, in the uh, short and longer term uh, if we can work uh, to, to address some of the challenges we have around diabetes. The other area uh, that my public health colleagues are, are working on, again, we've got some good examples of where um, we've been greening our estate as physical activity and supporting and encouraging physical activity and we believe that that's one of the key components. Again, through community planning, that's a, a, a strong feature uh, of uh, our, our approach. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, we are well over time, so can I uh, say thank you very much for uh, coming along this morning. It's greatly appreciated. There's a number of things that we'll follow up with you and we'll correspond with you and some information that you'll, have, you'll provide to us as well. But can I thank you this morning and uh, we'll break uh, briefly to change the panel. Thank you.
The third item on our agenda is an evidence session on the final report of the expert review group on targets and indicators. Can I welcome to the committee Professor Sir Harry Burns. Um, could I invite you to make an opening statement? Um, so when I was asked to do this, I think there was an expectation that what I would be saying is that certain targets and indicators should be dropped and others should be brought on board and things like that. And as I began to tease the whole issue out, not just targets and indicators for waiting times and so on, but across the whole landscape of health and social care and um, uh, the indicators that are already out there, it became pretty clear to me that just dropping some and pulling in others wasn't going to change anything. I mean, I think it was Einstein that defined insanity as carrying on doing the same thing and expecting different results. Um, it seemed to me that the problem with targets and indicators was not what they were, but how they were being used or not being used. Um, and a number of reports published out with Scotland confirm the fact that when you apply targets, yes, you can see some change in the way the system works, but very often it produces problems. Problems in terms of all the um, attention is focused on the target, but the target is just one slice of activity in a complex system. The length of time people wait in an A&E department is largely determined by the number of people coming in and the number of people going out, and yet we don't seem to pay too much attention to that. The focus is, did you make the 95% or not? And my recommendation, therefore, was let's keep the existing suite of targets more or less with one or two uh, alterations, but let's use them for improvement, not simply for judgment. Use them for continuous improvement in pursuit of an aim. And that was the other thing that I wasn't clear about. What's the aim? You know, what is the purpose of health and social care, and the only thing that was out there was the stated purpose of the Scottish Government, which is, which is to ensure all of Scotland flourishes through things like inclusive economic growth and so on. So if, if we are wanting a more flourishing, economically prosperous, successful Scotland with low crime, high educational attainment and so on, let's step back and think about what is needed to achieve that, and let's put targets and indicators in. Let's put indicators primarily in that would show progress towards that. The one thing that I would want to say, however, that I have recommended that I think is extremely important in pursuing that aim is to collect data on adverse childhood experiences. The evidence coming from a number of international studies of long duration and large numbers is very much that if you want a population that is educationally successful, that's successful in uh, the jobs market, that has low offending rates and so on, you need to pay close attention to the lives of children living in adverse circumstances. Um, and I can go into more detail on the, the data on that, but that is a problem. Advocating collection of data and adverse childhood experiences, because we've got no system to do that at the moment. And therefore, I would hope to be able to work with officials to design a system for collecting data and for um, developing responses to situations where children are living in adverse circumstances. So that, those were the main points that I wanted to make. This is about process, collecting data on processes and outcomes, not just slices of data that tell you where in, in, in a process someone is achieving 95% compliance or 85% compliance or whatever. So. OK, thanks very much. Um, there's a number of people who want to focus on the early years um, issues Good. that you raised, and I think that's, that's very appropriate. Um, just to, uh, initially, um, I think for a number of people who have followed some of the work that you've been involved in throughout your career, we were looking at this with great interest, um, but kind of feel a sense of being underwhelmed by it, that it took quite a long time, and... 
we kind of wonder what it's really saying. And, and I, I think you expressed that at the start, where you said that people had expectations of what the report was going to be, but it's kind of turned out something different. Yeah. Um, wonder if you could well, elaborate I, on that. You know, Am I wrong to feel a bit disappointed? Um, I, I, I'm quite excited. Because actually, there are very few systems in the world that are looking at health and social care as a complex system. It's an opportunity to take things further forward. And if folk were saying that, were thinking that I should advocate dropping the four hour A&E department, then they're very much mistaken that that is going to change anything of any significance. Apart from anything else, the four hour A&E target is one that has at least some evidence behind it. Um, but, you know, it, you know, if I give you an example using that target, let's say there are two hospitals, one achieves 95% compliance, one achieves 85% compliance, and everyone looks at the 85% compliant hospital and says, oh, they must be bad. Well, actually, if you then look at the system, if the 85% if the 95 compliant hospital, Hospital A, sees 1,000 patients a week in its a &E department, and Hospital B, achieving 85% compliance, sees 3,000 patients a week at its department with only 50% more staff, which one's more efficient? And if you look at the next bit of the system and see how many people are admitted, if Hospital B, with the 3,000 patients, is admitting more patients and they're staying longer, then it tells you that Hospital B is seeing sicker patients, probably. But at the moment, we don't collect that data that tells us how hospitals are functioning. It just look at that 85% compliant and the newspapers go crazy about it. So this is an opportunity to do something that's rational for a change rather than just picking numbers out of thin air. And I can tell you that numbers are picked out of thin air because... 20 years ago almost, when I was lead clinician for cancer in Scotland, someone came up to me and said, we want a target for cancer care. Does three months sound about right? And that, that tends to be, in, in the past, how targets were achieved. So this is an opportunity to move beyond that. And, you know, either we have the nous, either we have the will to do something really quite radical around improving performance in health and social care, or we just want to sit back and say, no, no, we're going to stick with the original targets. But you are sticking with quite a lot of the original targets you're keeping. Well, there. at the moment, until we have the data that shows that they are influencing outcome, very few of the targets are to do with outcome. We don't measure. Again, go back to the four-hour A&E target. The main data that says four hours is the right time comes from an Australian study, quite a big study, that showed that mortality declined and was at its lowest in the three and a half to four hour waiting time period. And then as patients waited more than four hours, their subsequent mortality increased. Now, is that because they waited in the A&E department or were they in the A&E department getting investigation and resuscitation and therefore they were sicker and therefore they were more likely to die? We don't know that. So, you know, there's a kind of... If, if you were managing a business, you wouldn't manage it with this kind of data. Ivan, is it on the generalities that you want to... Yeah, OK. Uh, thanks, and thanks for coming along and, and talking to us this morning. Um, I think I share some of the, the convener's kind of concerns that, of, of what, what, what's in the report in terms of um, what you've pulled together there. I suppose coming, and you mentioned business, coming from my background, this stuff's kind of second nature. So this is what you do in business. Um, the, the process you've outlined in paragraph 37, or started to outline, I think makes, makes sense. You need to know what your objectives are, your outcomes, and you need to know what your indicators, your KPIs are, then you set targets. There's a whole thing there about how you align organisations so that the right people, you know, who's responsible for hitting those targets, but that's probably out of scope. Um, there should be a kind of hierarchy of those indicators, so you know which are the important ones, which are secondary, which are feeding into those. Um, and then it drives improvement plans, which is the whole point, and we obviously had a session earlier this morning with uh, with Ayrsh and Aaron about how they were doing that. So that kind of structure all makes sense, um, and I think, to my mind, that, that's kind of well understood. But I think what you're saying is, 
uh, isn't well understood in the health service and further work needs to be done to kind of drive that understanding before we even go forward with actually reviewing the indicators, which is kind of what I think we all thought we, we, we would get to next. And, and just to take your point of, I think it comes out of what you measure and you talked about A&E. So yeah, you're absolutely right. If you measure a waiting time, that might not be the right thing to measure, but there are things that should be perhaps measured, flow through, um, demand, et cetera, et cetera. And maybe the issue is not that we're not measuring something, but that we're measuring the wrong thing. No, if I thought we were measuring the wrong thing, I would have said so. I mean, it's important to measure that four-hour waiting time because that's where the evidence that we've got points. But we need much more evidence about other things as well. Perhaps. Yeah, we need we need to know what the 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 process is in each hospital. Um, I think what I would say is, if you most businesses are far less complicated than society. Okay, because that in effect is what we're looking at here. You know, what is it that drives people into A and E departments? I discovered recently there is one A and E department that has about twelve people who between them over the last five years have accounted for two thousand attendances at the A and E department. Now that's telling you something about the way those individuals are the circumstances in which they're living. The answer's not about doing something to the A and E department, the answer's about all the other things that can support those individuals. And therefore, what we're looking at is an immensely complex system and we're trying to bite off small chunks at it. And it's, we're not doing the population any service in, in just narrowing it down that way. Well, yeah, I mean, it's, it's complex in one sense, but I mean, business problems are complex as well. Um, it, 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 I think that, I suppose the concern I would have is, you're saying it's too big and scary, we can't do anything, no, let's not, not do anything at all. all. And I suppose the question is, if that's not what you're saying, then what happens next? Who right. should do what next? That's a good question, and that's a matter for the folk up the hill. Um, what would your recommendation well, be that they do next? What we have seen using um, an improvement based approach in terms of patient safety and in terms of early years over the past few years is significant reductions in infection rate, significant reductions in hospital mortality, significant improvements in stillbirth rate and infant mortality in Scotland by applying a kind of co-production approach and let the frontline staff work to see what changes indicators that they themselves think are important. And the line I've used in this is that the data should be used for improvement, not for judgment. We should create, instead of creating a blame culture that says, OK, you guys are obviously useless because you're only achieving 85%, we should be creating a culture in health and social care partnership areas that says, OK, what are the drivers of demand? What are the, what's stopping people from being sent home so that beds are available and all this kind of thing? I don't have much sense that that's being done systematically because all the focus is on these hard targets that folk know they're going to get a thick ear for f missing. So do you think there's not a, an understanding that that culture needs to change? Well, I, oh, I think there are plenty of folk who understand that that needs to happen, but the focus from the press, from politicians, is all on you've failed, therefore, you know... So politicians don't understand it, it, that. It's, it's, the, it's the old thing that says, you know, what, what, what's counted is what counts. And therefore, people put all their attention onto the numbers that are being counted rather than trying to think about changing you th the system. You think system. that politicians don't understand that? Uh, well, <laughs> I don't think politicians do from the way in which they respond okay. to some of the data. OK. Now, just pick up on a couple of other things before we finish. Um, you, you kind of hinted, just to clarify, are you saying that, that, that a general sense, the very first part of this, obviously setting your objectives, what you're trying to achieve, are you think there isn't clarity there from a top level as to what it is we want the system to achieve? I, I took in the report the stated purpose of the Scottish Government, mm -hmm. which I think is pretty broad mm -hmm. in terms of its appeal across the political spectrum. And that seems to me to be as good as you can get. There are a few other countries, I think, that have set themselves a purpose in the way Scotland has. Um, but it's very broad and very top level. 
it, it's broad, but it's got enough in it. You know, okay. this notion of flour a flourishing population. Okay. One where the kids do well at school, where they get into jobs, where they're creative, where there's low levels of offending, and all of that adds up to the definition of well-being. Okay. So I would be content to go with that as a purpose, but the statement in the report that this should be the overarching aim which all the targets and indicators should lead towards is the first time I've ever seen that. Okay. Uh, you, you, there's, there's obviously a, Final a, a bit quite, yeah. There's at least, well, I think there's three frameworks you mentioned. There's a national performance framework, there's a local delivery plans, and there's health and social care indicators, yeah. I think, as well. Uh, is there a need, you kind of hinted at that, is there a need just to kind of get that into one? Yeah. And if so, whose job is it to do it that? Interacts. You know, the, 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 the health service targets are one sliver of a broad system that, that, if managed appropriately, could enhance well-being, lead to decreased demand, could lead to, you know, better outcomes in the, the national performance. So those should all be crunched into one? They should be seen as part of one system. And to be perfectly honest, the national performance framework, while we mention it, I don't know what the mechanism for change in that is. You know, again, health, we're focused on health. What can be measured is what counts. National performance framework... You know, they measure outcomes in every year or every two years. Mm. Okay. Thank um, you. Alison. Uh, thank you, convener. Um, it's clear that you're advocating a greater focus on the early years, um, as you did in your previous role. And I suppose, you know, we've had a real... Well, I think the new CMO, there's a different focus there. Um, you know, we've been speaking a lot about care for the elderly, um, chronic illnesses, the realistic medicine agenda, but you're really advocating this life course approach. And I'd just be interested to learn how you think that might help us address some of the challenges we face. You note that we're the Scotland has the lowest life expectancy out of 16 Western European <coughs> countries, and that that has only happened since the 60s. So, so yeah, I, I'd just be interested in what that life course approach might look like and how you think it would help us address some of the unintended consequences of the targets. So the evidence around adverse childhood experiences, which comes predominantly from an, a very large, prolonged American study, study carried out in New Zealand, some work done in England and so on, shows that children who experience very clearly defined adverse events, and that's things like experiencing physical violence, experiencing emotional neglect, experiencing... Um, parental absence, either through parental imprisonment or parental mental health problems. Postnatal depression, for example, is a very significant adverse childhood experience. Four or more adverse events, when those children grow up, the evidence is they are eight times more likely to become alcoholics or other substance misusers, eight times more likely to be arrested for violence, uh, significantly more likely never to work, significantly more likely to be a, to, to require health care and so on. The English study showed that four or more adverse events in early life, you had, if you had no adverse, none of these nine defined adverse events in early life, you had a 35% chance of having a chronic illness by age 60. If you had four or more, it was a 70% chance. Um, the American study has calculated that one year's worth of child neglect in the US brings with it a lifetime cost to the American economy of $124 billion in terms of demand for support and care, failure to pay taxes because those individuals never work and so on. Now, pro rata, the Scottish equivalent of that is one year's worth of child neglect in Scotland bring, may bring with it a lifetime cost of 1.8 billion pounds. So you get that early years right, the children do better at school, they're less likely to, to fail when they move into the workplace, they're less likely to go to jail. So the life course begins to move in a different direction. There was a report published uh, a few weeks ago where um, they pointed out that the greatest number of deaths from drug abuse and alcohol in Scotland was it were in 40-year-olds. Well, 10, 15 years ago, the highest number of deaths in 
uh, from drug and alcohol abuse was in 20-year-olds. And what we're seeing is a cohort effect. Mm -hmm. The people born in the 60s, round about that era, are moving through the life course and they're acquiring all sorts of problems. The way to begin to fix it is to change the life course at the beginning. Yeah, you've got to do the things to the rest. You know, you've got to support them, you've got to provide services for them and so on. But we better start getting it right in early years if we want to have a flourishing population. I mean, if we know that that mortality relates greatly to young people, or those young people yeah. are now carrying those conditions um, throughout life, what can we do um, to make sure that we address that? Because all the targets we've been discussing here, they seem far removed from that sure. life course approach. Well, the, the work that I've done over the past 10 or 15 years has been to demonstrate the biological consequences of adversity in early life. It always seemed to me that if you just expressed an opinion that <laughs> adversity in early life led to all sorts of problems later on. Yeah, folk might recognise that, but if you can show that there are biological changes that lead to problems, then nobody can argue with that. And we have shown that. We've shown that through studies carried out in Glasgow that involved measuring neurological function and so on. And fundamentally, children who experience adversity in early life, brain development leads to reduced ability to learn, reduced ability to suppress inappropriate behaviour, increased emotional ability. So you've got kids at school who are, you know, more anxious and aggressive and fearful, less able to suppress those tendencies and less well able to learn. We've shown biologically different brain patterns in affluent and deprived Scots. We've measured psychological function and so on. Can you change that in later life? Yes, the evidence is emerging. This is relatively new science, but the evidence is emerging that there are certain things that can be done to reverse some of those brain changes. One of the most important, and this is what you see in the third sector, the third sector is particularly successful at this, one of the most important is mentoring, is supporting individuals living chaotic lives. Um, I, and I'll give you an example of... <laughs> A jaw-dropping outcome. Um, I recently gave a lecture to chief English chief constables at one of their CPD days. And afterwards, a chief constable of a county in England came to me and he said that his force was currently doing a randomised controlled trial of criminal justice. So if you were arrested in his county, they went through a screening programme so that serious offenders, murderers, no question, they were charged and they went through court. But medium and low risk offenders were randomly allocated to being charged and going to court or not being charged and therefore not acquiring a criminal record and having a support package of mentoring and so on. He said the two year follow up, within two years, the reoffending rate of those that go to court was 65%. Those that got the support package, it was less than 10%. You know? So there are all sorts of different ways of doing this, but we follow those folk through the life course and support them in ways that, that keep them involved and engaged in society. And we'll begin to get that bulge of low life expectancy throughout. We um, recently heard, I think it was an informal session, but uh, I know the convener will know the, the, the um, person I'm talking about, but we had a, a session with ex-prisoners, and one of them who'd been in prison, <laughs> I think several times said that those in prison had changed markedly over the years, and he felt they now resembled, it, it felt more like a mental health ward. And one of your suggestions is reporting the incidence and prevalence of mental health problems by the S. IMD index. Yes, yes. Um, I just wondered why you think that would be so useful um, when it comes to identifying the impact of other interventions. So when you look at things like domestic violence and incidentally the American study, given all the, uh, the focus that's on education just now, the American study showed that the single biggest predictor of educational failure was witnessing domestic violence in the home. Um, so Adverse childhood events are not exclusively associated with low socioeconomic status, 
but they tend to be more common in areas of low socioeconomic status. And that was largely because of worries about money, worries about alcohol consumption. And there's a cyclical effect. I've referred to this as the cycle of alienation. When I talk to young people in prison, you know, an 18-year-old who's been in Pullman or whatever and he's about to get out, so I talk to him and I say, what are you going to do when you get out? I'll never get a job. I've got a criminal record. So what are you going to do? I'll sit at home, I'll watch telly and I'll drink. That's literally what I've been told. But what they don't factor into the equation is the girlfriend will have a baby and that baby's then born into a chaotic household. That's where you begin to break that cycle, intergenerational cycle. So I think it's hugely important for us to focus on that life course, but that the focus begins with adverse adversity in families and focusing on them. And you will see that bulge of dysfunctionality moving out of the system. Thank you. Hey, Alex, then Jenny. Hi. You can be next. Good morning, <coughs> Professor. Um, the, your section on adverse childhood experiences was music to my ears. Uh, having worked in the voluntary sector for 15 years, eight years of that for an organisation which delivered trauma recovery for children of all ages. Um, so I was delighted to see that and del delighted to see your push towards a more trauma informed approach. The NSPCC report, Right to Recover, uh, identified that 15 out of 17 local authorities that they examined did not have any trauma recovery services for the under fives, and a further 11 of those 17 had nothing uh, for primary school aged children either. In your recommendations, you suggest that we should set up a protocol for the management of such cases. But that's as close as you come to calling for the intro widespread introduction of trauma recovery services. Why did it's, you pull your punches Well, in that? because that wasn't what was asked to yeah. do. I would anticipate and I earnestly hope that some group is set up to consider the collection of data on adverse experiences and the management of it. So we start yeah. off by identifying the problem and then I would love to be involved in further discussions on this. And I have been looking at this. One of the most interesting things uh, in this area um, is the Barna House system in Scandinavia. Problem is a three-year-old who's been abused, um, who's experienced either sexual abuse because it happens in nursery schools or physical abuse, the way in which our current system treats them because of legal requirements reinforces the trauma. You know, the, the accuser has the right to be there. If they're having their evidence filmed, then the video has often been an instrument of the abuse and so on. And therefore, the trauma is reinforced by the way we manage it. And we have to start looking at alternatives. And the, and the Scandinavian system, as is often the case, has a far more sensitive and uh, rational way of collecting evidence that allows um, abusers to be dealt with. But, you know, it wasn't my job. I, hadn't, I wasn't asked in this to come up with the solutions. I was there to say, well, actually, our targets and indicators system is probably not fit for purpose. No, I get that. And that, I understand that it would have felt like mission creep to then start calling, laying out other recommendations, which perhaps might have been more linked to your work with the early years collaborative. Um, on that, though, I, I mean, I, I think I support it because I, I absolutely believe that we still have this cultural reality of what gets measured gets done. Absolutely. So if we're measuring childhood trauma and lack of trauma recovery, then perhaps that will sort of pump prime local authorities, health boards and everything, yeah. to build those services around the, um, the children. No, I, I think that's it, Convener, that's, that's what I wanted to Jenny. Thank you, Convener. Um, I'd like to take you back, Professor, to the National Performance Framework, um, obviously, which looks at dental health, CAMS, waiting times, babies with a healthy body weight. And then in the report, you go on to mention GRFIC, and you say that it is not clear how this system identifies ACEs and it would be helpful to see if there is a standard approach to identifying and managing neglect in babies. So in terms of those processes and outcomes, do you think there's a disconnect between education and health? <sighs> no. 
No, I mean, I talk a lot to... I probably talk to more teachers than I talk to doctors. I know, actually, the last time I saw you, you were in front of my higher class, so <laughs> <laughs> I'll put that on the record. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I actually get more sense out of teachers than I get from doctors. Yeah. But... <laughs> but, <laughs> but um, so, so there is an understanding of the close link, but there's no real understanding about how you manage that, yeah. how you do it. I mean, the, the, fact, the fact is that, you know, I, well... I was speaking recently to a head teacher who'd just been given five hundred thousand pounds for his school to yeah. spend on whatever he liked, and his comment to me was, "I don't really need this. I'd far rather it was spent giving the kids a decent breakfast before they came to school." Mm. And that is part of the, you know, p people have different ideas, and if we were to, we're a small enough country to sit down and say, "Okay, what is the link here?" Mm -hmm. The link is absolutely cast iron. The adversity before you go to school leads to failure when you get to school. Yeah. And if we're serious about a, a flourishing, a inclusive economy, then we've got to get that link built more strongly. Now, things like GERFEC and so on, all well-meaning policies and so on have all arrived, but it's time someone sat down and looked at a system to create success at school mm -hmm. and pulled all of that together. Yeah, I would agree. Um, can I move on to something? Okay. Uh, on page 18, 71A, one of the recommendations uh, you state, uh, analysis of school attainment rates should routinely consider the effect of adverse circumstances yep. arising from socioeconomic deprivation on attainment. Obviously, school attainment data is a very narrow measure. Yep. What other factors then specifically do you think should be taken into consideration? Well, what are the things that influence attainment rate? And mm -hmm. we've already mentioned things like adversity in the mm -hmm. home, exposure to violence. Um, one of the most complex things here is this notion of mentoring. Um, I keep, you know, I keep seeing people who, you know, we all, all of us here have some person in our family who was the first person to go to university. Mm -hmm. I mean, we've all started off coming from a difficult, you know, a, probably a poor background and emerged and so on. And so, and I keep coming across stories of a mentoring process, for example, that bumped into a former medical colleague of mine who was volunteering as a mentor and the boy who lived in Postle Park that he was mentoring had just got a place in medical school. Now this boy was so poor that he had to walk the 45 minutes to school and back every day because he couldn't afford the bus fare. Now there are guys from Lindsay and Bears Den that don't get into medical school coming from the best schools in Scotland. So it's that kind of thing that we need to be focusing on more, supporting people who might not feel that they have any place at university and convincing them that they should. And there are a number of projects out there developing the young workforce. Um, uh, the school uh, in Newlands in Glasgow that takes troubled children and trains them very effectively to go on and uh, go to university or succeed. There are ways of achieving success that we should collect data on and try and do it more consistently. But to do piecemeal approaches yeah. just fragments it all. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Brian. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, so hi, I, th I find this topic fascinating, especially around the, the link between as Jenny says, education and health. And with, with that in mind, and with early intervention in mind, um, are we, are we when looking at targets, why are we not linking targets with health, with, with educational targets? Uh, and should we be looking more cross-portfolio? Especially, I'm really interested around this, this idea of access to opportunity at a very early age, or lack of access to opportunity, understanding that access, and perhaps... Uh, well, with education in mind, do we have an opportunity around the 30 hours of free childcare to have a more positive intervention around early? Because it seems to me, if, if you're if you're 40% likely to be 40% behind the time you get to primary school, why are we focusing on primary school? Why are we not focusing yeah. on that? I, I, it comes back to this idea of the life course approach, and the life course begins 
as soon as the pregnancy test is positive, basically. It's that whole thing, seeing children, you know, when the UK chief medical <laughs> officers a few years ago sat down to dis to consider recommendations on alcohol consumption during pregnancy, I was the only one that said, I do not want, I want the recommendation to be no alcohol during pregnancy. The others said, oh, maybe one or two drinks and so on. You know, drinking alcohol during pregnancy has impact on brain development. And um, so we start there, we look at the whole life course that way. We don't start at, at aged five. Um, the ever there's a there's a in fact the adverse childhood event study calculated cognitive performance at aged two and at age ten by socioeconomic status, and you had a group on the ninetieth centile very high performers from both ad, both affluent and deprived backgrounds. By the time they reached ten, the affluent ones had maintained their cognitive functioning. The deprived ones had just deteriorated over that period. So the evidence is that there are things that we need to do throughout childhood to support these kids achieve their, um, their very boss, best possible educational outcome. And what I wouldn't want, and I think you're absolutely right when you talk about um, a holistic approach to this, you know, pulling it all together. At the moment, you will have groups working in different silos, all trying to do something similar. And at the end of the day, you're not going to get a harmonious result. You're not going to get a result that you can apply indicators to effectively. So I, I would really want to see us co-producing with teachers, with children's carers, with third sector organisations and so on, a programme for leading children to the best possible intellectual place over the first 10 years of life, because if you get them to that point, they'll do quite well thereafter. So at the moment, we don't have any way of doing it that, and I, that's why I was saying we should have a set of indicators for this, but it's not up to me to say what they should be. It's up to the whole system to design them. So, can I, could, so if I could extrapolate that a little bit then, are we talking then, or could we realistically state that um, educational intervention has such, a, has a, such a huge part on health outcomes later in life that we should be looking at education much more than... It, so I spent five years as a consultant surgeon in the Royal Infirmary in Glasgow and it was that experience that prompted me to go into public health because I kept having patients come to me who were there because they, usually as a surgeon it was because they drank too much and they had gastrointestinal hemorrhage or something like that. that I had to, and you'd say to them, if you don't stop drinking you're going to die. And the response would be something along the lines of, well why should I care, life's really crap and I don't care, the drink's the only thing that makes life worthwhile. So they get to that point in life where they have no sense of purpose, no sense of meaning, no sense of self-efficacy in life, yeah. and that largely comes because they've had a difficult childhood that sent them on that road, mm -hmm. this cycle of alienation. The kids, so a kid who's ex experienced adverse events is more emotionally labor, less able to suppress it, so he's badly behaved, so he gets excluded from class because he's disrupting education, a policy which I think is nuts. And when I asked a school, an education department, could they provide me with data on who was excluded from school, they couldn't. Yeah. They didn't know who was being excluded and how often they were being excluded. Um, so these kids are excluded from school, they've got it in their heads that they're stupid. They end up drinking bottles of cheap vodka or maybe not so cheap vodka now. Um, and they get into fights and they go to jail. That's the life course that adversity sets them on, often. And unless they get picked up very early on and get mentored and supported and so on, we're, we're you know, to talk about it in purely economic terms, and that's not my nature to talk about it in purely economic terms, but it's a huge waste of human capital. These are the kids who should be the 
doctors, the lawyers, no, I'll leave the lawyers out of it, should be the, <laughs> the doctors, the engineers, the, you know, the inventors, the artists, the musicians, and instead they're ending up in Portland. I could talk about this all day, but I'll give some. <laughs> Happy to talk about Can it I all day. <laughs> pick up on a couple of the issues you've raised there. Um, on a number of those areas in early life or throughout a person's life, the, the group of people who would have picked them up would have been either youth workers, yeah. child development workers, third sector organisations, yeah. either um, employed by or funded by local government. Now, how can we address? How can we address these very serious issues that you're raising? Yeah. When local government services are disappearing through your fingers, and I know when your previous work that you worked very closely with local government, so you you know this stuff yeah. inside out. So is this not? Is this? Are we not in danger of exacerbating this problem with what's going on at the moment? Well, I'm in the process of working with five or six local authorities and their associated health boards. I'm just in the process of pulling this together where we are thinking about applying a different pattern of service to people living in difficult circumstances and measuring it. Just yesterday I interviewed for four PhD students who would help me assess the impact of all of this. Um, and there is no doubt that we have to work differently uh, with public sector organised, not just public sector, but public sector and third sector organisations who are confronting this kind of problem. And my hope would be that that would give us the evidence that we need. I think youth workers might be too late. You know, I think it really needs to start... Workers and nursery staff. Yeah, and yeah, outreach. nursery staff, the, the, the health visitors... Uh, you know, the Family Nurse Partnership, for example, one of, the, one of the most inspiring things I've ever witnessed was seeing family nurses who had worked with six pregnant 16-year-olds. I mean, and the, again, one that um, I met where I watched this young girl with the baby. The attachment between her and the baby was absolutely secure. The father appeared and he was similarly attached and the family... and. The girl then said, right, I have to go now. There's a taxi waiting to take me back to school. And she was sitting five hires and she wanted to be a lawyer. And I said to the family nurse, if she hadn't been, if you hadn't been there, what would she be doing just now? She said, she'd be wheeling the pram down to the shopping centre and drinking with her mates. You know, that kind of intervention, yeah, it's expensive, but it's gold dust. One year's worth of child neglect... One point eight billion pounds lifetime cost. Yeah, but, but it doesn't. These services don't run on fresh air. They don't. So, um, Ash. Thank you, convener. It's been a very interesting discussion. Unfortunately, I'm going to change the topic slightly and go back to the, the targets. So you recommended keeping most of the targets, but one that you suggested maybe should be dropped was the 18-week guarantee. Um, you said because possibly that alters clinical decision-making. Could you say a little bit more about that? Yeah. So someone comes with um, a complex problem. Um, you know, they may have complex abdominal pain. They may have... Um, an orthopaedic issue or whatever. For a start, it can take a good few weeks to run down the diagnosis. Um, it might be that as you are narrowing down the diagnosis with different tests and so on, different options for treatment appear. You may well offer a treatment to the patient who would ask to go away and think about it. And if the clock's ticking, it kind of puts pressure on both the clinician who's trying to come up with the right management strategy and the, the patient themselves who may want to take time to go away and do it. Now, okay, you can come up with all sorts of strategies like the clock stops whenever the patient decides they want to think about it and so on, but, but that's not... That's not um, it doesn't build good clinician-patient relationships. You want to build a relationship with a clinician is trusted and feels he is supporting the patient through this. 
I would not want to go back to the days, I mean, when I was a consultant surgeon, I used to manage my own waiting list, and like all the other surgeons in the Royal Infirmary, you had a waiting list where every week you would take patients off it for the next week's surgery, and the most serious ones came off, and the ones waiting for varicose vein surgery or hernia repair or whatever it might be waiting two years. Mm. And all of that was swept away because of a big investment in waiting list initiatives. And I may say, I never did any private practice, but I may see my colleagues who did were driving big flash cars on the back of the waiting list initiatives. They made a lot of money out of it. Mm. So, yeah, patients shouldn't have to wait but imposing a target where that target might actually interfere with the clinical decision-making mm -hmm. and the doctor-patient relationship is not a good thing to do, and especially not a target that is legally enforceable. Mm -hmm. And you also said that it might um, also affect patient choice as well, and that patients yeah. need time and um, decision support tools, you mentioned, in order to make an informed yes. choice about yes. the treatment that they, yes. they want. So I suppose where we're going with this is if we're saying that the 18, or if you're saying the 18-week guarantee is maybe not, you know, is cutting across these kind of issues, can you, how would we decide on a, a better target that would lead well, to the right outcomes, the I outcomes think, we're looking to develop? So there is, once the decision is made, then you've got the 10-week target. Mm -hmm. So that's there as the backstop. What I'm talking about is that process between referral and deciding that this is what is clinically indicated and what the patient wants to accept. Mm -hmm. And that can take longer than eight weeks. You know, all things working smoothly, it can take longer than eight weeks to do that. Um, you know, complex problems shouldn't be rushed at. You need to stop and think and discuss with the patient what the options might be. And, you know, I'm seeing things like decision support tools, things like the internet and so on, are making patients much more aware of their options, mm -hmm. and that's a good thing. Yeah. Uh, so in the old days when you would see a patient say, I think you need such and such an operation, and they'd say, I okay, and they'd go away, and they'd, you know. Things have improved a lot, and patients, <sighs> the word empowered is an overused word, but patients should feel more in control of, of their these big decisions. Okay, thank you. Okay. Yeah, Miles. Thank you for being here. Um, I wanted to pick up in terms of what impact our target-based approach to health is having on people working in our health service, and specifically this week it's um, been reported that across NHS Lothian's A&E units, for example, there's been the under-reporting yeah. um, of people um, within the 18, uh, within that target. But specifically, do you think that's becoming common throughout the health it, service of massaging figures or underreporting? I have no factual insights into that, so anything I would say shouldn't be taken as as gospel. Um, yeah. as gospel. But it wouldn't surprise me, because what gets measured is what counts, and um, it's not right to put. You know, people who work in the health service genuinely want to do a good job for their patients. And putting them in a position where they might have to behave dishonestly is not a good thing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's why I'm suggesting that look at the whole system so that if there is, if there are a lot of people waiting in an A&E department? Is it because there aren't sufficient beds in there? Is it because there are too many inappropriate, you know, folk just pitching up because they have problems that could be more effectively managed elsewhere and so on? Um, we need to understand that and not put the blame on hard-pressed A&E staff. Um, and that's why I'm suggesting co-production involve people in designing what the processes and and uh, indicators should be. And what you'll find is they will go much more much further than what a bunch of officials would do. Yep. They will want to do the right thing. I mean, the, the patient safety programme, I am absolutely stunned at the results of that mm -hmm. because the frontline staff got the bit between their teeth and they eradicated whole swathes of infections. And when I worked in intensive care units, 90% of people ventilated for more than a week had ventilator-acquired pneumonia. 
In some hospitals, it's years since they've seen a ventilator required anymore because the staff changed the way they worked. Mm -hmm. So involve them and you will get outcomes far better than you ever anticipated. And how do, can I just come in briefly? That how do you think we can move to that outcomes-focused NHS? Then, because there's lots of pilots, we hear them all the time. There's lots of good working in areas, but that doesn't get rolled out, and there doesn't seem to be that learning. And you talk about this systems thinking, but you know, how can we make sure that professionals can have professional responsibility, it, and what, and how you then yeah. aren't measuring that? When we really ran the Early question. Years Collaborative. Every five or six months, we would get 800 people from every local authority and from every health board in Scotland into a room who were involved in early years care. And they would sit down and they would share ideas. And, you know, it's, it's like athletics. <laughs> <laughs> athletics without the drugs. <laughs> Is that an accusation? <laughs> It's, or, or maybe more appropriately, the UK cycling team. You know, <laughs> lots of marginal gains. So, the athletes and the cyclists. <laughs> so, um, so you tested things and you got two or three percent improvement in performance, and you found the earliest collaboratives. There were what we counted one thousand five hundred things that were tried, mm -hmm. and maybe sixty of them actually yeah. produced a benefit. And where you did all 60 of them consistently and collected the data that showed you were delivering it, you got a step <coughs> in performance. Yeah. An 18% reduction in stillbirth rate over a matter of a few years is unheard of. So it's about bringing people together and making it plain that we want to hear what you are doing. We want to hear what works, and crucially, we want to hear what you've tried and doesn't work. There is no shame in failure except not telling people you've failed. Mm. We tried this and it didn't work, so don't waste your time. And gradually, you build improvement that way. A colleague up in St Andrew's House, Jason Leach, Professor Jason Leach, He's the guy that can do this. He frightens me, so he... <laughs> so, uh, Emma. Thank you, thanks. Um, I think you've covered a lot of uh, what I was thinking about, but last week Dr McIntosh talked about um, the paternalism of healthcare originally, and then um, if you can count it, it counts, which you've talked about as well. And then looking at um, a more professionalism approach or a moral approach is where we need to be at, but also not forgetting that targets do inform yeah. us about where we need to go. So I'm, you know, I was directly involved in the Scottish Patient Safety Programme as a clinical educator, nurse at NHS in Fries and Galloway, and we had a multidisciplinary team approach because that's where you get all yeah. the views. So I'm interested to hear about uh, what your thoughts are about the whether we should be moving to a less target-driven culture and a more professionalism, moral approach, uh, I, as Dr McIntosh outlined? I think a less target-driven approach, but a stronger indicator-driven approach. Targets delineate the end of a journey. OK, we've made the target right, we can stop trying there. But indicators tell you the direction of travel you're on. And, you know, so a 15% reduction in infant mortality is a good thing, but we should keep going. Um, so indicators, understanding the way you want to go. The early years collaborative, things like ensuring that 90% of children attain all their developmental milestones at the 30-month health visitor assessment, for example, was something that the frontline staff identified as an indicator on the way to improving intellectual performance. So... We need indicators, but the indicators need to be feasible, they need to be pragmatic, and they need to be co-produced. And we need to be able to say, OK, we've done that now, so what's the next thing? I mean, at the moment, some of these targets seem to be cast in stone, and the thought that, you know, you would move away from them is just, you know... We should be aiming high with them. So indicators tell you that you're shooting for the stars, but you don't want a target that stops you trying it. And bringing people together, a critical thing about bringing people together is you have to bring the front line together, but the bosses have to be there. The heads of um, health boards and so on have to show 
the front line that this is important by their presence. You know, in <coughs> what I remember frontline staff in uh, Tayside Health Board when Jerry Marr was the chief executive up in Tayside, they were really impressed because he came on ward rounds. The chief executive of the health board was there on ward rounds to show that <coughs> the hand washing and so on was important. He was taking an interest in what they were doing. So leadership from the top, but frontline staff being there to create the change is the way to do it. And all the co-production that you're talking about and all these masses of programmes and integration of joint boards. There's so much happening. Yeah. Will we see a tipping point eventually? Do, obviously, it's constant, constant hard work that the frontline staff and everybody it, has to engage in. Yeah. But surely it, there should be light uh, at the end of the tunnel. I mean, you get this... And integration between health and social care is really important, as is integration. We've talked about integration with education and all this kind of stuff. That's important. But... Creating new organisations, you know, organisations will tend to have their boundaries and cross-boundary working become, you know, the more you fragment the system, the less well able you are to get a coherent strategy. So that's why this report starts off with talking about how we achieve a flourishing population in Scotland. Let's start off from there and let's see how we design a system that takes us all there. And when I think about, I mean, I've never been a member of any political party, nor would I ever want to be, um, but uh, there's something in this that goes right across the political spectrum. There's social justice, there is excellence in outcome, there is economic development and so on. It's about creating a society that we all feel proud of. So if we put that in the forefront, how do we design the indicators that show we get there? I mean, if you want me to, <laughs> to go back and do phase two of this, then I could design something. But this has to be co-designed with the people who have to deliver it. It takes us to, well, what is the next stage of the process? Well, you would have to ask <coughs> colleagues up the hill. Um, who are these people up the hill? <laughs> Tell us well, who I, they are. I was asked, I've never met them. <laughs> I was asked to do this by Mr John Conaghan, right. who was Director of Performance, who is now no longer up the hill. He's direct, uh, Chief Operating Officer of the Health Service in Ireland now. And is so that John, because his performance was good or not so good? Well, I think he would see it as good because <laughs> he's still going to be in the, <laughs> the European Union, I think. But, uh, <laughs> but let's not go there. <laughs> Uh, so, I, I, my fear is that this gets taken away in the traditional way and designed by civil servants. Mm -hmm. This needs to be designed by people who are actually doing it. Yeah. And so... Rather, you know, so a year's gone by and I'm just getting out there and doing it. I got money from various sources. An, an American charity heard about what I'm doing and they said, we'd like to support this because we want to do the same in the US. Ask us for some money. So I asked them for half a million quid and they came back to me and said, no, you haven't asked us for nearly enough. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so, so we're beginning to get a group of local authorities who are expressing an interest in trying different things, trying to integrate things differently. But is that being done by you on your own? Yeah. Right, so we need to then, as a committee, find out what the next stage in this process is. That's what we really need to that do. That would be very helpful to okay. me. That's probably, probably a good place to finish. Yes, OK. OK. Can I say thank you very much? As always, it's well, um, good you. to have you before Thanks. the committee. It always uh, provokes a very interesting conversation and there's much for us to think about. So thank you very much. <laughs> and as agreed previously, we're now going to private session. Thank you.